Wow. It's been a while to, to host a in-person or I would say hybrid uh, workshop after a long time. I think last time I did was we did in 2019 probably, right? So um, it's good to see faces here. <laughs> good to be interactive. And I'm glad like with, uh, since you know this hy hybrid thing is working fine, uh, those who can't make it uh, for the for the workshop here because of distance or something else can still attend it uh, remotely. So it's a win-win situation. I'm happy. Um, those of you who do not know me, uh, I'm Aman Jyot Singh and I'm a senior engineer at uh, Cat Valley Conservation. Been here since uh, 2008, um, maybe eight, nine years more to go. <laughs> and then it will be time to pass on. Uh, the charge to, to the youngsters who are working in the team and uh, at CVC and uh, elsewhere. Um, so I hope everybody has the agenda. It's quite packed, so I, I don't want to take much time. Uh, just get started as people are logging in or coming in. Uh, um, so some housekeeping notes. Uh, uh, again, it has been a while since we are hosting this uh, um, in uh, in person. Washrooms for those who are from uh, other agencies, there's one washroom uh, right uh, by the uh, by the store. Um, it's a uh, it's a common one. And then there are additional washrooms on first floor of this building. So feel free to use if you need to. In case uh, emergency bell rings, there are exit signs everywhere. Just follow these and uh, we'll go out in case something uh, needed. Uh, coffee and refreshments, they are there. You know, keep keep yourself caffeinated. <laughs> it's a back dinner, like I said, and uh, we'll be talking a lot. And uh, yeah, so please uh, go ahead. And for those who are uh, attending remotely, again, you know, look at your washroom and uh, exit doors and uh, fill up your coffee cups. And please stay muted uh, uh, during the whole workshop. Uh, we'll really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, the main thing which will where you will need to use microphone is when uh, there is a question and answer session and we are encouraging that those who are attending remotely please uh, put your question uh, here it is uh, where it says q and a on your microsoft teams app use please uh, uh, that um, tab to put your questions and we'll answer as uh, as uh, we read them uh, and finally, this workshop uh, is being recorded and we'll be happy to share uh, with all who are attending. That's the purpose of uh, this. We are sharing knowledge and uh, we'll be sharing this presentation as a part of that. Oh, uh, you know, I wanted uh, to dedicate this workshop to Professor Trevor Dickinson, an awesome person, those who know or have been to University of Guelph, uh, Unfortunately, we lost him this year. A great friend. We used to go often for coffee and he used to attend and come to our workshops. Had knowledge of water quality, hydrology and everything. I've learned a lot from him and we used to discuss. Uh, love you, Trevor, uh, and we'll definitely miss you. So workshop goal. Uh, again, we have been hosting this. Uh, yeah kind of annual feature on different aspects. And uh, the workshop goal, which I thought would be good for this year, would be sharing knowledge. So you won't see all the presentations from CVC, but from those who are working on similar uh, objectives, uh, we thought, OK, why not to bring them together? And also those who are working or have interest in similar you know, disciplines bring them together and share knowledge where we are, what we have learned and what they have learned and what uh, where we can uh, you know, move forward. Advancing science. So this is again something which uh, as you will see in some of the presentation that what new tools we have learned, what others have learned and how we are trying to bring those together to, uh, to further the science. And of course, passing the torch, like I said, like maybe you know, eight, nine years for me to be here. So I, I'm glad and I love all my team members. 
youngsters. We need to pass this torch. We need to, to you know, pass knowledge, exchange knowledge. And of course, I means I learn daily from them because, you know, tech thing is something where <laughs> they're much sharper than I am, right? So that's where it is. Um, so some of the topics which were covered early, earlier in the previous uh, workshop, so like, you know, I, I said I joined CVC in 2008 and 2009 was uh, the first time when uh, uh, I hosted the workshop and the climate change was uh, uh, the topic for that. But moving forward, we have been hosting on real time water quality as the program was developing, what we were understanding from that system, how it was helping us. We're talking a lot about road salt. Uh, that's one of our uh, in portfolios where we work. Again, we are not directly dealing with the spreading of road salt, but we being also a partner of STEP program uh, and working with our municipalities, you know, showing them that where the environmental issues are and why it's very important to uh, to create efficiencies spreading salt. Um, source water protection again. Uh, being a water quality lead, uh, I have uh, worked on a number of uh, you know source water protection files. Uh, even joining CVC before CVC, I was at Gunaraska Conservation Authority, so Tier One was where I worked on. But moving on, like it was more related to regional appeals, uh, lake-based intakes, travel time, spills, uh, stuff. What what we worked on and we presented. Lake Ontario monitoring. Um, so. Uh, Lake Ontario shoreline uh, strategy was uh, integrated. Uh, you know, uh, sorry, Lake Ontario integrated shoreline strategy. <laughs> I worked on that, and Kate is here, so he's laughing because I, you know, I got good funding from her <laughs> as she was new and she didn't know me that I would ask for uh, you know different kind of money, but you know now she knows. <laughs> so we did uh, presentations on that that how. Uh, you know, water quality, uh, basically water quality of uh, the Credit River and other tributaries flowing directly into the lake um, uh, and how they were impacting Lake Ontario water. Um, and so I'm an expert in, you know, uh, this stuff now, so <laughs> hopefully you will have a good sleeping session. You know? <laughs> anyway, so, so today's workshop, uh, again, managing water quality. Well, we are trying to build up like means what type of management uh, techniques we, we will have uh, so that you know we can mitigate some of the uh, present issues and also in future issues. So the top uh, the topic or the presentation which uh, uh, CVC team will be giving will start with some of the real time uh, monitoring. Uh, uh, you know what we have learned and how it has helped us. And moving that into the integrated watershed modeling, which we are currently doing, right? So integrated means like we are connecting, you know, uh, surface water with groundwater, uh, with uh, uh, hydraulics in the in the stream, and how these things are uh, are important to learn in order to um, come up with the management practices. Then would come uh, to modeling BMPs, the best management practices, because that's the ultimate aim. That's what managers look for. That okay means if this is an issue, then how can we mitigate that issue? And uh, I'm glad you know I watched uh, 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 a recording from uh, Matrix Solution, and they were exactly working on on the similar lines where uh, I was hoping to take uh, our watershed integrated watershed modeling uh, to the next phase. So I invited them, and thank you so much, uh, Chris and Darren, for being here. And they will be giving this presentation. And like I said, that means source water protection. Uh, as you know, this is one of uh, um, conservation authorities' mandate. So we do work, and I do work uh, closely on Lake Ontario collaborative group of uh, uh, that works on source water protection. Uh, and I know there 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 have been advances, and uh, again DHI was hired for for this uh, work. And I'm glad Pat is here to give us an overview of where uh, that uh, uh, program is. And of course, you know, uh, tagging it further uh, uh, to, to algal issues, which are again um, uh, increasing or are, are of concern for both source water protection and for uh, uh, for uh, in the in-stream uh, aquatic life. Um, I'm glad uh, Ministry of uh, um, Environment, Conservation and Parks 
they started this project uh, and I'm glad uh, Todd is here, Todd Howell. You know, again, I have privilege to work with him since I joined CBC and I, I, I'll tell you honestly, you know, Todd was here presenting on one of the workshops and he was talking about Kladafra. And I was saying, hmm, what is Kladafra? So I wrote it in Punjabi, my mother tongue, and went back and saw that, okay, what is Kladafra? Oh, I said, oh, we pronounce it as Kladophora, not Kladafra, right? So, <laughs> so pronunciation differences and all this stuff, you know, you, you make it out as, as, uh, as you go forward, right? So, so um, Pat again will be, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, um, Borden, Borgen, uh, sorry, uh, what's, uh, uh, Bogdan, uh, pardon? Bogdan, yes. Bogdan couldn't be here to present, so I've asked uh, Pat since uh, BHI again was uh, hired uh, to do this work, so he will be speaking on on uh, uh, algal issues. And finally, like I said, that means it's all the knowledge gained from different projects that we are bringing in for Fairy Lake. Study Fairy Lake is a uh, is a you know, freshwater lake in Acton, Ontario. And they are experiencing um, uh, cyanobacteria issues. We will talk about that. Uh, and you know, of 12 folks. Uh, Mark is here. Uh, Kat uh, probably has not yet arrived. But she will be coming to speak on some of uh, those aspects. So, just again, going back to those of uh, you who are not very much familiar with uh, uh, Claret Valley jurisdiction, this is uh, what it is. Uh, skinny watershed goes up to. Um, yeah, Orangeville and uh, drains into Lake Ontario at uh, Port Credit, thousand square kilometer, uh, and uh, it has uh, about 1500 um, kilometer uh, tributary stretch uh, all the way, uh, if you include all the tributaries. Um, so, water quality again, you know, talking about this, like means, you know, since I've evolved, I'm every day I'm learning, it's a complex process because. If you look at the water quality, you know, these two glasses may seem, okay, you know, one is turbid and one is not turbid, but that's not the thing, right? So there may be uh, instances where this clean water may not be useful or, or good quality for the purpose which we are using. It may contain some of the dissolved uh, components which, uh, uh, which are not uh, suitable for that particular purpose. On the other hand, this mucky water, may seem of bad quality, but it may not be for certain aspects. Right? So you need to look at you know, what we are, we, we are into. So source water protection. Again, we go to Clean Water Act and we look at drinking water guidelines and uh, objectives, and we need to meet them in order to, to say that, okay, this water is good quality for drinking. Similarly, for aquatic life, the same thing, like means what, why, what do aquatic life or aquatic species need? Just an example. Chloride, uh, sorry, the nitrate limit for drinking water is 10 ppm, whereas nitrate limit for aquatic life is 3 ppm. So maybe suitable for us to drink, but may not be suitable for, for aquatic life. So you, we need to keep in mind that, that that's where water quality becomes complex. So as a water quality person, I need to understand that what, what we are trying to address. Are we trying to address aquatic life? Are we are trying to address uh, drinking water or something else? Something else is, uh, you know, wetlands wetland species, you know, we need to understand that what species are there in that particular wetland so that we can protect them, what are the uh, sensitive parameters for them, and go on. We can't spread salt again. Like I said, that they're very sensitive to, uh, to salt. And finally, for recreational purpose, you know, uh, E. coli, again, a good example here. So E. coli for drinking purpose is zero, but it may be 200 coliform units for, for for recreation. But again, there are other aspects also which you need to keep in mind when you're working on water quality to make sure uh, that's of good quality. So the first step for any water quality thing is to to monitor and see whether it's, it's good quality or not. And traditionally, we'll go with grab samples. We'll go out and take a sample and send it to the lab for whatever parameters we are interested in and then say, okay, means they are good or bad. What we miss in that is there may be some diurnal variations which are not captured because we that's a, that's the timestamp when you take took the sample that's what it is. If there was an event we don't know what was happening there, right? So it's amazing for uh, for waste flow conditions, ambient conditions, 
that may not be suitable for other uh, aspects. So we need to, to do something more. Technology is advancing, science is advancing. The event sampler, so we are focusing again, the focus here for water quality is event. So they are triggered over the event. They will take the samples across, uh, you know, over the hydrograph, but because they're expensive, we don't do analysis of each sample, but what we'll do is we'll flow with them, send it to lab and see what the quality is. Amazing program, expensive, but it's science is getting there. So wherever we need it, we have it. Then comes real time water quality. So not all the parameters, but this gives us opportunity to monitor some of the key water quality parameters at a resolution we had never expected. We do it for 15 minutes throughout the year. We capture all the low flow conditions. We capture all the events and then we can analyze and, and see that what's going on in, in water quality. So thanks to Regional Peel, it was uh, 2007, I believe, when we got uh, this climate change funding and that's the reason I'm here with CBC. That's when I was hired in 2008 uh, to work on this, uh, this project. Uh, so we installed our first real time water quality station in 2009. And we were all happy because it was all automized. You know, the sensor will read the reading, go to the data logger, go to the cellular network, come back and we see the graph and what the data looks like. We can crunch numbers from there. So as a team, which we started and soon I was able to transfer them, <laughs> transform them. <laughs> but that station didn't, didn't last too long. And the reason why, if you remember August, uh, 2009, there was a big storm event. I think it was either 50 year or 100 year storm event. And I was on vacation back home in India. I came back and uh, my technician came with and came, here's a gift for you. So this was the hydro lab which I gave him the sensor the saw. And this is what I got back because totally ruined. But since then, we have now 11 stations working since 2010, all installed since uh, 2010, between 2010 and 2013. Regarding these water quality parameters, which are very important and can be measured in real time. And all the data is available publicly at this website. So anybody can 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 you can use this data, can look and look at this data. We have seen, you know, uh, different organizations that Fish, uh, fishing organizations or other organizations using this data other than you know uh, academia uh, so this is this was a phenomenal uh, achievement for us that all these stations are running some unique observation like i said that means this was uh, uh, funded by region of peel uh, and uh, one of the aspect was uh, source water protection particularly spill and we did capture these spills so one, so all these uh, stations, we have thresholds that after a parameter is, uh, is exceeds that threshold, then we'll get an alarm. So we got the alarm, the dissolved oxygen was, was very low. We went out and saw that it was, a, it was a diesel spill because there was no response to flow. There was no response to any other parameters. That particular parameter was impacted. So this was identified. We coordinated with spill action center that was taken care of. Second time we had a turbidity spike again. No, there was no change in flow. Again, what was happening? It was a water main break, which was bringing tons of uh, sediments into the creek. Again, an issue we coordinated. But this is normal spike in water, normal response of turbidity, and that's how uh, it, it alludes to that it's a, it's a rainy event, which is which is happening. But again, inf uh, information which is very useful. We always talk about like means how do you know different type of catchments or watershed react to different storm or in similar storm event I would say urbanizing urban urbanizing or natural catchment and we were able to uh, you know filter those out and this is how a natural uh, uh, you know uh, catchment responded very little increase again still steady and then it, it kept going. And you see that uh, uh, the same response in turbidity, a little sharper here, but again, it, it's more of a uniform, uh, a normal uh, hydrograph. But if you if you look at the response from an urban scene with, with, without any stormwater management point, you will 
see a sudden increase in the in the concentration and sudden decrease when the, when that uh, uh, you know a plume is is gone. But urbanizing with ponds, you see some increase, which is relatively it's not as sudden as the without some sort of management pond, but still there. But then you see the recession curve, which is very smooth because that's when the stormwater management pond is releasing water uh, into the, into the sea. So that's what was happening. And when you look at all cumulative at most of the credit river, you see both the responses here. You see the sudden spike, but you also see you know uh, the recession curve going in for longer time. Algal gloom again. We got an alarm that uh, you know uh, the dissolved oxygen was uh, was pretty low. But then you look at uh, you know the diurnal variation. Daytime it's 15. Nighttime it's two. What's happening, right? You know this is not normal. And and this was May 2012, and uh, we went out and we saw that you know it was huge algal bloom in Cooksville Creek, and uh, we're trying to wrap our heads around like algal blooms in urban creeks is is uh, is not something which we don't expect, but that early and to that extent it was totally uh, a, you know unique thing. At the same time, I called my uh, my counterparts at Regional Peel to understand that what was happening in Lake Ontario. Same thing, uh, they, they, it was a huge uh, bloom of algae uh, in Lake Ontario, which was uh, sucked by the intakes, and these um, uh, you know uh, the filters were were, were were choked for quite some time. So this alludes to. Like I said here, this is something which which we need to keep in mind uh, as a, as a climate change kind of thing. So the reason in 2012, early on or late 2011, it was a, a mild winter, not much snow, not much snow cover uh, at, at the surface, not much spring fresh yet. So as a result, all the sediments were sitting there, which was full of uh, nutrients. And as the as the wind as the spring was mild, there was enough temperature. To, to create this kind of uh, uh, bloom. And for lake, lake was clearer compared to it was uh, in other years, so there was enough light to penetrate. So that's again resulted in uh, that. We also developed uh, a correlation for uh, turbidity, which is one of the parameters we monitor with the uh, with total phosphorus. And we uh, compared this with the with the grab sample data for a long time, and it's holding fine. What, what's missing in, okay, again, clearly, uh, uh, is that you know these peaks are not there. Again, like I said, chloride. We have observed chloride chloride levels exceeding seawater at some of the stations. We have also captured the diurnal variation in chlorides at some of our headwater stations, where groundwater is source of drinking water, and all of them use uh, water softeners to soften that water. That was again observed and shared with the our so taking it to the next phase was uh, to to go for for modeling, use this data and data uh, from uh, from the grab samples, which was collected in combination with the with the PWQMN provincial water quality monitoring network, and also uh, our own stations, all the island stations, um, and uh, calibrate that model and see if we, uh, how that can that modeling exercise can help us in management practices. So uh, the seed money came from uh, from swim drink fish. That that's where you know we launched uh, this modeling process, and then we uh, collaborated with University of Guelph, got some answered funding, funding the matching fund, and of course uh, uh, you know uh, supporting money from uh, from region of Peel, more you know focused toward watershed plan uh, that uh, also came to this uh, modeling um, uh, exercise. Again, you know, the project team, and this is <laughs> the team I started with, matured very well, right? So <laughs> they had how they look. So <laughs> I'm happy to, and uh, I love you folks. You know, the incredible work that I, I won't call that they do hard work, they do smart work. And that's why where we are, uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. And somewhere there I'm sticking. So, and we have team from University of Guelph, which, which is again focused on, uh, on uh, 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 water quality uh, modeling, uh, Munir Bhatti is uh, is uh, uh, very knowledgeable uh, and uh, you know key person to go for us uh, on any kind of uh, you know modeling uh, things. It works very 
smartly and 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 all the time he's just find his working. And we recently hired uh, Sudarsh. Uh, he's a MN student working on a smaller uh, aspect of modeling. And of course, uh, I collaborate a lot with uh, Professor Ed McBean uh, uh, on uh, any water quality. Uh, work. So again, modeling concept first when we start, uh, you know, setting up the model is to identify that okay, what are the sources of contaminants are, and what are the contaminants of concern. So again, non-point and point is something where we want to, to properly identify and all our models uh, have wastewater treatment plants coming in as uh, point sources. But when we go to the urban area, it becomes a little bit more, I would say quite more complex because you look at uh, the, the subdivisions or the sewer shed as non-point contributors, but when you go to, to, to the receiving water, it's coming out as a, as a point source. So we said, hmm, you know, this is something which we need to capture. We we have not been doing that uh, earlier. We uh, have now started, you know, uh, taking this approach and looking at one uh, pilot uh, watershed and, and how we can incorporate that. But this will be a phenomenal advancement in in our modeling um, uh, scenarios. Um, other sources of interest, of course, groundwater. Uh, and that's why we, we call it a, like integrated model because groundwater source, uh, the two main components which we focus on, something which is naturally contributed from uh, from the groundwater. I'll give you an example. We had a station where aluminum concentrations were, were very high and it, the station was uh, downstream of a wastewater treatment plant. We always used to say, oh, maybe it's coming from the wastewater treatment plant. Said, oh, let's go step back. Why would aluminum be in? Uh, coming from the wastewater room, is there something else? So I spoke with my uh, colleagues who are uh, uh, groundwater experts, and I know Dan Banks uh, is on the call. He's with the, with the region now, and uh, we're talking, and we looked at the data, the groundwater data, and groundwater aluminum concentrations were quite high there. So it wasn't, the, the uh, again, identification of source is so important here because it wasn't, the wastewater treatment plant, but it is uh, groundwater, right? So we, we wanted to capture as the best as possible that how groundwater can be incorporated, especially for phase two and other stuff. Then atmospheric de deposition, we are not touching this at the moment. It's it's very complex and uh, uh, will will still park. But again, you you folks know that it, you know the the phenomenon of acid rain that how it happens and how it comes back to. Uh, uh, to to the land is uh, something which we'll be, you know, uh, looking into later on in some of the phases. So again, model selection is is always there's so, so much uh, out there, and every model has something unique to to deliver. Uh, we're looking at uh, different models. So we have had experience with the CS Watt and Canvet and other models. But ultimately, you know, when when we are doing modeling, one thing to keep in mind is. If you look at this as a reality, you hope for this, and ultimately, if you <laughs> go with this one, you're okay. You know, you have done something, right? So, uh, so we decided to go with Mike Shi, and the main reason was that it's an integrated model. Like it, it does uh, surface overland routing, it does bed zone routing, it does uh, saturated uh, zone routing. I'm uh, again not saying that it's an easy model. <laughs> we have been bugging, you know. Uh, had for uh, for quite some uh, uh, understanding into the model, but again, we are still uh, getting where we want to be, so it's solving our purpose. It gives us flexibility because uh, it has additional Python uh, compatibility. If we want to go uh, beyond what is uh, being offered in MyQ, we can use that, and it can be also coupled with lake models and other. And of course, you know, uh, it's generating output, uh, which are very visual, uh, are very important. You will see those outputs, which are important uh, to talk when we are talking with our managers and all the stuff you, you can show. Because visual, again, things are are much more uh, uh, um, convincing than 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 the words. Um, so again, like I said, that the main focus is okay. Means normally we'll say that okay. Means this is a concentration of a particular parameter at the outlet, but ultimately we want to see where that particular perma. Uh, particular parameters coming from, what is the hot source, what is the contributing spot for that particular uh, contaminant so that we can have a best management practice which is suitable for that site. Again, 
I'm saying it in words, seems pretty easy, not that easy, right? But that's where we want to go, right? So if we start now uh, and develop our long-term goals, that's what, uh, what the aim is, uh, uh, which we are looking, uh, looking for. And we started, uh, I didn't want to develop one uh, model for the entire jurisdiction of CVC, because then if you want to zoom into something, it, it, uh, it kills you, right? So, so we, we developed 22 models for the entire CVC jurisdiction, and then they're seamed together. And the grid size is 50 meters, which is, uh, which is pretty reasonable. We didn't want to go um, below that. It's, uh, it's uh, computationally uh, very intensive. Uh, so we, stuck, we, 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 we are sticking with 50 meter grid. Um, and again, you know, uh, we started with the three saturated zone layers, which again, thanks to Oak Ridge's Moraine, we, we got it from the source water protect, uh, protection work. Uh, but for our pilot two sub watershed, we have extended that from three to 13 sub, 13 uh, groundwater layers. So they are part of uh, the model. Uh, and we, we, the, the water quality parameters we are focusing on at the moment, um, total suspended solids uh, that includes the, the table end contribution and also in stream contribution, total phosphorus, chloride, and uh, water temperature. Now I'll give it to Jan to talk about uh, evapotranspiration because this is one of the critical parameters which uh, while going through this uh, modeling exercise, we thought we need uh, a little bit more uh, into this. And uh, So one of the most important components for both our input and output data for our modeling is evapotranspiration. And there are two very important parts that are difficult to monitor, difficult to measure, and that's evaporation, evapotranspiration, and recharge. Typically, we'll measure evapotranspiration potential ET first, and then we'll run it through the model and output the actual ET. And estimating or calculating potential or reference evapotranspiration is done by using either simple or really complex equations. And we selected a method called the penman monteith method. Um, there are great variations in ET as we found throughout our watershed. And it's due to a couple important geological factors. Primarily, there are two major environmental factors that influence ET on our scale, on the subwatershed scale. And that's the elevation from the Niagara Escarpment and the Oak Ridge Moraine in our upper subwatersheds and Lake Ontario to the south. Lake Ontario is nearer to our urban subwatersheds, and our more rural subwatersheds are up in the northwest part of our jurisdiction on top of the escarpment. And then, as well, a major influencing factor is the land use. So here's a map of uh, our subwatershed, our watershed, and you can see the uh, darker, grayer colors further to the southeast. Those are more of our urban areas. And Phenomena like urban heat island effect will have a great impact on the abundance of water and as a result, the evapotranspiration that we calculate. So we selected the penman monteith method and it was chosen because it is more accurate than the common methods for estimating potential evapotranspiration. And the output for the penman monteith ET method is referred to as reference ET. It's used in combination with crop coefficients to get very specific, more accurate 
estimates of ET based on a uh, targeted type of plan. Reference ET can be seen as the maximum potential ET in an area, and it's uh, it refers technically to a very specific type of grass with very specific parameters. So it combines energy with mass balance, all of the energy coming in from the sun and how it's moving. And it uses inputs like air temperature, humidity, wind speed, dew point, and uh, solar radiation. So the energy parameters that the Penn and Monteith method uses are net radiation and soil heat flux. This is the energy coming to our, our area and then uh, climate parameters. And the ones listed here are just a function of the basic parameters that I mentioned earlier. So in modeling, we have used an abundance of stations. We've, uh, here's a map just showing a few uh, orange and green dots that depict a few of the water quality and climate stations in our jurisdiction. What you can't see here are the uh, nearly 40 precipitation stations that we used to input uh, data into the model and a number of other stations that we source data from outside of our jurisdiction because our model takes hourly data for 10 years from 2008 and some parameters like solar radiation and wind speed are not so easy to find at that interval so we went to uh, a few external sources. Here is a uh, graph or a map showing the sub watersheds in call two boxes adjacent to the colorful uh, polygons and then beside them a green to red uh, color gradient box depicting the reference ET the 10 year average reference ET that we calculated for each sub watershed. And note the difference in the more urban sub watersheds to the southeast versus the more rural ones to the northwest. We're able to get this kind of resolution because of the abundance of data that we have from our real time stations and the uh, data that we got externally. So the urban sub watersheds you can see have a much higher reference evapotranspiration. Again, this is the potential maximum that could occur based on the data that we have. So we input that potential or reference evapotranspiration along with precip data, along with a bunch of other parameters into Mike Shee, and it calculates actual ET from snow, canopy, vegetation, plant transpiration in the saturated water in the saturated, unsaturated zones, and from soil evaporation. Mike Shee will take all of that data and it will output the actual evapotranspiration as it sees relative to the, our inputs. And now note the difference that we observed from the outputs. Here we have the same map as before. However, the uh, green to red color gradient boxes are the reference, 10 year average reference ET on top and the actual ET from Mike Shee below. And you'll note the difference in the southeast end of our watershed where the urban subs are. The reference ET was much higher than the outputted actual ET. And this is due to the abundance of water. Our urban area simply did not have that same amount of water that was estimated from our reference ET. Also, if you guys don't mind, I'll be taking some photos. Yeah, so so the purpose uh, uh, was uh, not. So the purpose was uh, not to set up the model with one or two climate stations and uh, other people could have uh, its unique uh, climate station and climate data and the uh, unique uh, web transpiration. Okay, all right, sorry. I have a, I don't know whether it's a good or bad habit of moving when I'm talking. <laughs> So that stays with me, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, so using all that data, we we 
uh, we had uh, a water balance for, for all our uh, 22 sub watersheds, so which, which is again the key driver for, for uh, uh, other parameters. Uh, then we, would, uh, we did for total um, suspended solid, uh, uh, dissolved phosphorus, and total phosphorus. So again, this shows the calibration of the model as far as flow is concerned, and this is with the real time data and how closely these peaks are matching, uh, the model peaks are matching with, uh, with the observed data. And this is uh, uh, again dissolved phosphorus and uh, total phosphorus. You see, so we, what we did was we did particulate bound phosphorus, we did dissolved phosphorus, and combined them to get the total phosphorus. And th these uh, these are the simulated values, and th these dots are what you are seeing as uh, as the grab sample just for valid validation. And uh, this is similarly for dissolved uh, phosphorus. Um, again, we generated uh, loads for each sub watershed, and also there are three distinct zones, uh, the upper, middle, and uh, uh, and lower zone of uh, uh, CVC jurisdiction. So we, we picked those numbers and uh, and got uh, the loadings for each. And then we are coming to chloride. Again, this is uh, uh, one of uh, our uh, um, parameters of interest uh, for modeling. Um, and I'll, uh, and Laura does a lot of work on, on chloride. So I'll let her talk about that. All right, so we did chloride modeling focusing on the Huttonville Creek subwatershed. This one's about 33 square kilometers. It's located almost entirely in the city of Brampton, although the uppermost northern part is um, in Caledon. The subwatershed is bisected by Mississauga Road, which runs, you know, we'll call it north south more or less. And so there's a clear west branch and east branch. The west branch is really agricultural, whereas the east branch has experienced lots of rapid recent uh, residential development. And the west branch, while it's currently agricultural, a lot of that area is slated for development in the future. So this is really a subwatershed where um, we can see the impact of rapid uh, residential development. So the purpose of our chloride model was to understand more about this uh, really important parameter of concern in our subwater in this subwatershed. Some of our real time stations in our jurisdiction have measured concentrations as high as seawater in urban areas. And it's also a problem for uh, drinking water because, of course, we have municipalities that rely on groundwater for drinking water and we're seeing elevated chloride concentrations there. So we wanted to create a model that could run a number of scenarios where we can see the impact um, of, for example, continuing on with business as usual with having that increased development in the West Branch and maybe uh, reducing salt use if we're able to implement some best management practices. So we wanted to see what the impact of those scenarios would be on surface water and groundwater chloride concentrations. So in the model, we're assuming that all of the salt applied is sodium chloride, and it's that chloride component that we're modeling. The model requires um, an hourly time series of chloride, um, so we apply that evenly to all of the urban areas, which are shown in red on this slide. And because it's, it's really impossible to get actual observed data that reflect salt application rates, because it's coming from municipalities, it's coming from uh, private contractors. So this isn't data that you, that you can easily get access to, particularly on this kind of fine scale. So I created an input uh, salt application time series that's based on probabilities. So every timestamp will be filled with a salt application value based on some probability. So there's a high chance that it'll be zero. There's a low chance that it'll be a really high rate and then a, a chance that it'll be a lower rate. So you end up with kind of this um, distribution of salt application. And so I looked at what 
the seasonal totals from that would be. So for each year, what would the each winter season, what would the total salt application be? And compared that to actual salt application data from the town of Orangeville, which is a similar size to the urban area uh, in this sub watershed, just to make sure we're in the right ballpark. Um, so we ran the model for 30 years with no salt in the system to begin with. We used climate data from 2008 to 2021. And of course, having no salt in the system in 2008 is not a realistic representation of, of those conditions at the time. So rather than representing that, that time period, what we're doing is just trying to create a, a generic kind of 30 year period of data. And we used 2008 to 2021 because that's what we had available. We don't have a 30 year um, record for this, for all the input data that we needed. Um, you'll notice that that's only 14 years. So we just basically copied pasted that. Um, so once we got to year 15, we just started over again at, at 2008, just to make up that 30 year period. And we have observed data from our real time water quality station. So observed chloride data from 2013 to 2019. And that's what we use to, to assess the results of this model. So this is a modeled chloride concentration at the outlet of Huttonville Creek, right where we have that uh, monitoring station. There's a, a more rapid increase for the first 10 years, you know, because we're starting at no salt in the system, gradually slows down and then kind of looks like it, like it stabilizes um, a bit towards the end, but we would need to run it for, for longer, I think, to actually verify that. And salt is being applied at more or less the same kind of total seasonal amount each year. Now this blue line is the observed data. Um, and as I mentioned, we're just looking at a, a generic 30 year period. So you could shift this observed data probably more to the right to reflect kind of 30 years of, of salt accumulation before you reach 2008. Um, but we're just using it at this point to see if we're matching that general pattern of build up during the winter, kind of extreme spikes that happen during the winter, lower concentrations during the summer and fall, and in some cases um, drops down during that the summer and fall that uh, reflect dilution. So if we zoom in on the model data in black here and then observed in blue, there's also, I don't know if you can see it that well, there's little red points that reflect our graph sample results during that time period. So you can see the model is capturing those sudden spikes that happen in the winter. We are getting a gradual accumulation of salt, like buildup of salt in the system during the winter, although it's not quite reaching the peak that we see in the observed data. And you can see in the observed data we're getting um, in, in the fall here, dilution happening rather than than um, spikes when we get rain events and that's not yet reflected in in the model data but that's something we're working on these box plots are just kind of a different way of, of visualizing that data of visualizing the trends that we're seeing over time so this is monthly annual box plots of uh, distributions of chloride concentrations at the at the outlet of Huttonville Creek. So the top bar, the top plot is from September, the middle one is October, and then the bottom one is November. And then each plot is um, the distribution of salt concentrations that were measured in that year, sorry, that were modeled in that year. We use the fall because this is when it's reflecting base flow conditions. So you get more of a, idea of what the general long-term trends are rather than what the influence was of the winter severity of the amount of salt that went down that winter specifically. So by looking at this, it does kind of give the, inv the indication that concentrations are still increasing in general. I'm just gonna move on to the groundwater component now. So we have 13 groundwater layers. I'm gonna show you a video of how uh, chloride moves through those layers. So just to explain what you're looking at first, the inset is, a, is showing you the, 
the spatial distribution of chloride concentrations in the second layer. So we're going, the color is showing you what the, the concentration is, ranging from blues and purples, which are low, up to uh, greens and reds, which are high. And then there's a, the main plot is, is, a, is a cross section, so kind of like a slice right where that red line is located. So it's showing you the concentration in each of the layers at that point. So you'll see it build up at the surface and then kind of move down as we go through the video. You'll also notice the clear difference between the west branch and the east branch, where the west branch is undeveloped. So you don't see that build up at the surface. But because of the topography of the of the groundwater layers, you do see it kind of move in there uh, from the east, and you can see that reflected in the uh, the distribution with the uh, the inset map. And this is showing the full thirty year run, so it's running through that pretty quickly. So if we were to take, so the model is divided into <clears throat> 50 meter by 50 meter grid cells. So if we were to take one of those cells and look at how chloride concentration changes in the different groundwater layers at that one cell, this is an example of what that looks like. Um, so you can see the upper layer is, is that purple one that is really heavily influenced by seasonality by that salt application directly on the surface. And then that kind of dissipates as you move through the deeper layers. And the deeper layers gradually build up over time as they receive more salt from, from the upper layers. So this means that over time we're seeing more salt being applied each year than is being removed. So we're getting an accumulation of salt in the system. And this red line is showing salt, uh, cumulative salt retention, which over the 30 year run is still going up at a slower rate than it was initially, but definitely still increasing. And then the blue line is an average annual um, salt retention. So that's gradually going down, but still above zero. So these will be really interesting figures to look at when we start running um, the management scenarios to see if we reduce salt application, when do we, when, if and when do we start to see the uh, negative retention? Do we start to see more salt leaving the system than being added each year? How long do we have to reduce uh, application for and by how much do we have to reduce it? These are questions that we want to answer. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, just for fun, we ran a scenario where salt application completely stopped entirely after 15 years. So this is the exact same salt application data for the first 15 years, and then it just drops down to zero um, after that. And once again, we're looking at concentrations in the different groundwater layers. So even after it stopped entirely, we're still seeing increases in all of the, all of the layers. The deeper ones will start to decrease once they reach the point where there's no more contribution from the upper layer. Oh God, how long is the deepest one? I mean, it's going down into the deepest of our of our layers. It, like we have 13 layers, and we see increases all the way in 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 layer 13. I couldn't tell you a, a number of exactly how deep that goes, like a few hundred meters or something. Come on, do you want to speak into here? <laughs> I thought I was loud. <laughs> so, so we have this whole sort of protection model. So the layers would uh, differ in depth across the watershed, right? So we, we don't know for this particular cell that how uh, the depth was for different layers, but that can be extracted out uh, pretty quickly. The, the purpose which why we have this thing is that it shows that even when you seize uh, 
uh, with a similar, you know, whatever um, groundwater layer condition is, even if you cease applying uh, road salt, still it would uh, uh, accumulate for initial years. But once the layers are really uh, uh, below, like means, I, I don't want to put a number that how deep, it will still increase because it's leaching down. There's no outlet uh, going to uh, going anywhere. So that's that's where the concern is. Yep. Yep. It's combination of both, right? So there will be some which will be uh, going out from the shallow layers to 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 the river network, right? So that that's being removed from that vado zone or or partially saturated zone. But with whatever is going down, again, it's a good question, I, and we can come back to that. But we'll need to dig into more, like means which layer had which, how much permeability. But what we are trying to show is it still goes down even when we stop because it's still leaching. It's still in the system. For a more specific question, we can we can we'll like to definitely come back to you. Um, so these are our, our box plots again, the same ones we were looking at before, but with this scenario where salt application stops after 15 years. So you can kind of see how that plays out in terms of in-stream concentrations here, where there's a fairly uh, gradual decline over time. But if we compare this to the uh, chronic water quality objective, there's still about four or five years in which the median concentration remains above the water quality guideline, uh, which is, of course, interesting. Um, of course, this is not a realistic scenario. So once again, we want to see what would happen if this was, say, a 10% reduction, 20% reduction in salt, what that decline in in-stream concentrations would actually end up looking like. So finally, um, we found that having a model that integrates the surface water and groundwater is really key, especially for something like chloride modeling, where a lot of the concentrations is driven by that base flow and where we see a lot of uh, retention year over year. And we think that this, this model is showing a, a lot of promise for running these management scenarios and answering some of the questions that we have. Of course, there's refinement that's needed in the future, particularly, I was gonna say, over these, over better understanding the movement of water through saturated zone layers and refining that uh, salt application amounts. That's all I have, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so this work is evolving and we are getting into different phase, uh, phases and that's the reason we have you all here that will keep you posted on like uh, uh, where um, when we refine these things. But what we wanted to make sure like uh, your question was to use that particular model so that we have all the hydraulic parameters uh, which are consistent with what were used in the groundwater model, but then we'll be extracting that, okay, which layer because of its uh, physical properties have different accumulation. Um, and like I said, that uh, another uh, topic which, uh, which we are trying to cover is, is water temperature being a concern, concern for climate change, uh, especially and for our, our aquatic life. And uh, uh, Alex will, uh, Hello everyone. I'm also prone to walking around, so uh, just let me know if I go a bit too far. Okay, so water temperature is getting higher and higher in our watershed. So two main reasons for that, climate change and urbanization. So the high stream temperature has been causing some issues as we have some temperature sensitive species such as 
brook trout and red side dace. There's an increase in submergent and emergent vegetation and also increase in algal blooms. You already saw this picture. This was, oh, too far. So as it was mentioned a few times, we had the algal bloom in May, and which is unusual for this watershed. And it was due to high temperatures and some other climate factors. So there are many components that would affect the temperature in stream. So this includes uh, climate conditions such as air temperature, the amount of sunlight, wind speed, humidity. There's base flow as obviously the groundwater temperature has a large impact on the stream temperature. During storm events, the amount of overland flow is, uh, is really important. Riparian cover is really important due to, you know, uh, plants could shade the stream. And also stormwater management features such as ponds can also have a large influence on the temperature. So if we want to model the water temperature in the stream, ideally we'd have something that can include all of those factors. So Mike Shi, as like Amon mentioned, is water resources model, which calculates flow to the river from both the overland flow and the saturated zone, Vado zone, and can associate a temperature with that flow. Mike Hydro River is a hydrologic model that calculates the flow and temperature within the stream. And then Mike Ecolab can be used to determine the uh, rate of change of temperature from various physical processes that include a lot of different external energy sources and sinks. So all three of these can work together and be run at the same time to basically include all the uh, factors that I mentioned in the previous slide. So going a little bit more on uh, Ecolab and the different uh, external processes that we can measure with that, we can uh, look at convection, which is heat transfer due to the movement of air and water and how that might affect the uh, transfer of the air and water boundary. There's latent heat, which is the heat loss from the water due to evaporation. Short wave radiation, which is the thermal radiation from the sun, and long wave radiation, which is the thermal radiation lost from the water to the atmosphere. And Ecolab can also be used to look at different groundwater temperature processes, such as advection and conduction. So and then we can also look over time at the different components I mentioned. So this is about a month. You can see the diurnal variation. So the thing that stands out is that the red lines here, which is the shortwave radiation, so the basically sunlight, is by far the largest uh, contributor here. And this can show us how much of an impact things like shading of the stream can have. Because if you can lower this, then that's a lot of energy that you're blocking from reaching the stream. So all those factors are calculated with the uh, Ecolab. And as I mentioned, Mike Shi tells us the amount of overland flow and groundwater that em enters the stream and then works with Ecolab to see how that affects the temperature. And then Mike Hydro calculates a temperature at various points in the stream that you can then look at. So to show some of our results from Huttonville Creek, which uh, Lorna was talking about earlier, it's in Western Brampton, and we have a real-time water quality station there to uh, compare our results with. Here's about a month of data in the summertime. So the blue line is the air temperature. The black line is our model simulated water temperature. And the green line is the observed water temperature. So there's a really good match between our observed and simulated water temperature, which makes us pretty happy and shows that, you know, so far it's doing a pretty good job at modeling the temperature. And the uh, model is very useful for doing things like identifying hot spots in the stream, which can help us pick areas to focus mitigation efforts. And you can also look at how the temperature changes over time. Work that way. Yes. 
Yeah, I just click the play. So here you can look at the change over time at one point and have a history of the temperature. And here you can see the uh, whole sub watershed with the you know, red is hotter, blue is colder. And you can see how it changes over about a month. And using this, it's, I mean, A, it's cool to look at, but also you can use it to, like I said, identify key areas for mitigation, identify which areas may be contributing a lot of, of the uh, high water temperatures. So where are we gonna, where do we go from here? Well, there's, we wanna continue to calibrate the model. So one thing that we're really looking into is refining our low flow channels, as those can be really important in terms of base flow temperatures. So right now, our low flow channels are mostly the cross sections we have are from LIDAR data, but we'd like to go and physically measure a lot of those to just increase our accuracy with those. And then we also want to look at a number of future scenarios. So different climate change scenarios, different development scenarios as the watershed is you know, increasingly being developed. And then also see how different mitigation efforts can, can possibly affect in those different scenarios. So this includes low impact development features such as green infrastructure. So those not only will they improve water quality, but Reduce, like slowing down runoff will also help with water temperature issues. Then also the impact of riparian cover buildup, which as I mentioned, increases the amount of shading on the stream. And uh, finally, the impact of removing features such as stormwater ponds. End of my presentation. I'm, I'm hosting this workshop after quite a long time, and I am a speaker. Like I, I like to talk, so we are going a little over time. So we'll have the questions uh, after uh, Matrix present. And so since the modeling effort, the next phase is to do um, uh, the management scenarios that how these green, uh, you know green infrastructures or or other things would uh, would benefit. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, that I came across uh, some of the work which Matrix has done. Uh, so. I like uh, them to present on like how they have been using uh, these type of modeling uh, platforms to understand uh, where the water is going and where it's beneficial to have some kind of uh, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so one question from the chat, Alex, what is the pond removal mitigation scenario? Uh, we have not yet done the pond mitigation, but that's on the radar. Uh, we tried it on one of our sub watershed, but uh, we need a better bathymetry data in order to first simulate that how much um, heat uh, a pond is, uh, is retaining and what will be the benefit uh, out of that. So stay tuned. We'll keep you all posted on that. Thanks for that question. Chris and uh, and Aaron. Yep. Yep. Please. Uh, so follow up from Olivia S. Also, how is beaver activity considered in the baseline temperature modeling and mitigation scenarios? It, Are beaver dams warming or cooling? Yeah, uh, they have not yet been included, but we'll keep that on our to do list. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation, Amanjat, for having us here today and present some of our work. Um, we'll stay with integrated surface water modeling. We've been using that for, I would say, maybe the last 12 years um, to evaluate uh, different land planning scenarios, including LIDs. And we'll share a little bit of that, um, how we evaluate that both for um, the LID function and the ecolog ecological function. So we'll start off with um, very brief, just some context around the stormwater management and integrated modeling, but we really want to focus on these case studies um, where we talk about different planning levels and how we use MXG to evaluate um, impacts and an LID function. So when we look at the traditional stormwater management that we're all familiar with, we're usually looking at mitigating flood and erosion risks. 
by using centralized, often end of pipe uh, facilities, stormwater management ponds. And the focus is really on the detention of the volumetric management of those runoffs. And the, um, the, uh, the, the thick, oops. Yeah, so when we're, when we're looking at what we're, what we're trying to do by, uh, you know, is when we go from the, the, the undeveloped catchment to the developed catchment, we're trying really to, to manage that, that peak, that, that volume. When we're looking at including low impact development features, LIDs, where we're trying to capture and re retain and eventually infiltrate at least some of the smaller and more frequent events. Um, there's, there's that distinction because the, the bigger storms will not be managed by LIDs. That, that's just not, you know, the volumes are just not feasible. So there's still that component of the stormwater management past that initial piece. And we're looking at distributed source control. And really the goal or the focus here is to you know, look at the ecological, ecological function on a sort of water, water balance level. Uh, we, we are specifically looking at the connection between the service water and the groundwater here, maintaining that function, that connection, with a focus on the aquatic um, fish terrestrial habitat and, and to some degree the morphology. On the next slide, I'm just going to speak a little bit about the difference between traditional modeling for. We have the service water models that are often lumped models based on hydro, hydrogeologic response units. So PRMS and PC swim are good examples for that. Then we have the groundwater models, mod flow and, and fee flow are probably the best known that focus on the, on the groundwater. And what we're trying to do here with Mike Shee is looking at both. So we have everything together and really the it, it, it includes the entire water cycle from precipitation, infiltration, runoff, evapotranspiration, you heard of that, and then also the groundwater. And really the key piece here is that interaction, that feedback between the service water and the groundwater. That's what service water, service water models alone or groundwater models alone cannot really provide that direct feedback between the two components. With that, I want to get into our first example here, and this is sort of the highest level in the planning where we, where we really test um, what's needed to maintain the groundwater function. So we're looking at a site here in uh, north of Toronto in, in Markham, North Markham. Currently, golf courses and fields, and it's proposed to be developed into this beauty. Um, and so the question is, uh, you know, what, what are the impacts are going to be? And from a from a planning level design criteria, we were trying to optimize the runoff capture that we need to capture at the source, uh, optimize the location and dimension of LIDs um, to control some of the runoff, but but also to or mostly to maintain groundwater recharge, the depth to groundwater gradients and and discharge to service water features and then evaluate the local and cumulative effects of all of that on the, on the ecology. So in this particular case, our best friend here at the red side days found in some of the streams is supposed to be there still in 20, 50, 100 years. All right, so a quick look at the model that we used here. Um, it has this little L shape along the Pruce and uh, Bursu Creek. Um, the dimensions here about four and a half to five kilometers. We used a similar grid size to what Alan Judd was talking about, 50 by 50 meters. And these simulations, different to service water models, where we're often looking at event based modeling, we're doing these continuous simulations in time with a, with a focus on the groundwater function here. So then, what we're getting out of the model, a couple of examples here when we, when we, um, evaluated the, the current conditions. We have the spatial distribution here of recharge and Jan mentioned that earlier. That's one of the things that are hard to measure, but we can simulate that here and we get get that spatial distribution. We can look at um, temporal changes of groundwater discharge to the stream. Um, and here similar the spatial distribution of the groundwater discharge to the stream. And one thing that's particularly neat is this map here on the bottom where we can actually identify the area 
in the subwatershed that contributes to a particular tributary. So you can make that spatial connection between the recharge area to the to the discharge in the stream. And that's really what we want to maintain. So then uh, once we build a model and, and validated it against um, the existing conditions, we applied this proposed land use, and I'll just highlight a few things here in the north. We have a fairly large area that's proposed for employment. In the center here, that uh, salmon color is residential neighborhoods with some schools and parks mixed in. And uh, along the main roads here, we got mixed use corridors, both residential and commercial. And so what we did is we put that in the model and we ran it without any LID features throughout. And what this is really showing in, in these red shades is the areas where the, um, the groundwater levels will drop. So we have a lowering of the groundwater levels uh, throughout large parts of, of the area here. When we run the same thing with some distributed LIEs, LIDs, um, and we, this example shows 10 millimeter capture throughout the, the area, we can actually start seeing that uh, some of these areas, the water table comes up. So we're actually, in a, in a way, overcompensating. We're recharging more now than we did before. So that would actually, uh, well, too, too much in a way. So what we did then is we did a few iterations throughout and we, we played around with how much capture is needed in which area. We came up with this map. So uh, in, in these, Brown color up here is the highest capture of 10 millimeter, and that's throughout the employment lens, which is not really surprising because it's pretty densely developed. And then throughout the residential areas here, which is the, the ones with the dots in it, you can see the different colors, which is indicating that depending on where we are in the system, we go from two millimeter to four to six millimeter capture. So depending on the geology, the topography, and all these other factors, um, we can actually fine tune that, that, that amount of capture. So that was the first part of the study where we really looked at sort of a, an areas management plan. We looked at catchment level targets and objectives, made sure that those were um, met. And then that provided us a tool to go into the next phase of the project. And I'll stay with, with the same side here, um, which is on a development level um, now. And we're looking more of a site specific conceptual testing. Um, so, which actually includes both source and end of pipe controls. So again, this is the area we were talking about, this L shape, and I'm just zooming into the centerpiece here now, which is, is this area here. The different colors again are the, the capture amounts that we determined would be needed to maintain the ground of function varying from two, three, and four millimeters, um, and that's per imperious hectare. And so in this, this part of the project now we went to the next level where we actually got the um, the proposed um, use or, or proposed mix of source controls and end of pipe controls. So in, in pink here, these are distributed LIA features, uh, real lot infiltration galleries throughout, but acknowledging that that probably won't be enough, they also proposed a number of centralized facilities here in blue and these were um, you know, th these would be underground storage tanks and I just want to show uh, in this next example now where the, the value comes in for the, uh, having service water and groundwater in the same model here so this is one of those tanks it's a design drawing and cross section so we can see the topography up here and then here is a is one of the creeks and opposed is this infiltration tank and the idea is that water from paved runoff gets captured here, sits here, has the opportunity to infiltrate, and if that doesn't, you know, that doesn't do it, it will overflow into into the cat into the stream. But this is really the, the purpose here. And when we did the simulations initially, what we got was this, where we actually found that the water table was too high to have that chamber infiltrate. In fact, the water, the groundwater was coming into into the infiltration tank. So we, we went back to the developer and their engineers and, and communicated that so that they could actually make adjustments in terms of placement and, and, and design 
to make that work. And that's something that a service model model alone will, won't tell you, which is why really that integrated piece is so important. So here the, um, yeah, the, the, the goal was really to test the developer's proposed uh, site-specific design, confirm that um, the design can maintain the management objectives, and uh, and yeah, and then we provided some additional feedback in terms of you know fine tuning design and location and future monitoring. And with that, I will hand it over to Darren, who will uh, speak about our wetland focused. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so I saw Leah Leffler's on the phone, and Leah was part of this project that I'm going to talk about here in the city of Guelph. I need to stand closer. Okay. Maybe tip it up as well. So um, I'm going to talk about this is an example from the city of Guelph. Um, we're looking at the the large map on the upper left shows the Claire Maltby secondary plan area, south end of Guelph, last sort of undeveloped area within the city of Guelph. And we developed similarly uh, a Mike Sheet model for that entire study area to look at evaluating existing conditions, uh, the functions, groundwater flow, um, how much the area recharges to the bedrock aquifer in Guelph, which is really important, and also understand how groundwater and surface water uh, work within this marine area. What you can see in the bottom corner is kind of an existing land use map. Uh, the pink area in the middle is Hall's Pond, which is one of these depression, close depression wetlands. And pretty. Uh, what's unique about this whole study area is there's no headwater, headwater streams within our study area. So there's a number of these uh, depressional wetlands that are shown in pink and they were included in that subwatershed scale or uh, study uh, secondary plan scale Mike Shee model. And so we developed existing conditions model. Then we layered on the land use as Chris showed for for Markham. And what we you know we we're looking at a number of things, including groundwater recharge, etc., uh, and whether that's maintained under future conditions. But one of the things that came up is we noticed the water level in Hall's Pond uh, was going to increase by an unacceptable level so it was on the order of 25 centimeters and the question was was that acceptable if we're if we're from an eco ecological point of view so is 25 centimeters matter so um probably a lot of people in this room are experts on wetlands more so than i am and wetland hydro periods but just to get us on the same page our question is does it matter if that water level is increasing by 25 centimeters and what the diagram on the right shows is that for that wetland, there's probably a winter level and a summer level or a wet and dry period level for that pond that supports different types of habitat. Um, and there's that potential that if we were to flood or increase the water level, we may flood and change some of that seasonality and that's gonna impact the communities that are within the wetland and may change those communities. So what we set out to do was take that uh, uh, secondary plan scale model and refine it a little further around, around the um, wetland to try to understand what that hydro period means. How much area is going to be uh, flooded? How much would that represent? So how would the footprint of that wetland change? So we had it um, as part of the study. We had a lot of really good data. We had uh, groundwater levels from shallow and deep system. We had another number of dry point piezometers associated with the wetlands. We were able to make plots such as these at the bottom right corner that shows water levels in the shallow deep system as well in the wetland and we can understand seasonality of groundwater discharge from the to the wetlands or groundwater recharge from the wetlands to the groundwater system which was a key component um, given the time here i think if you have a look at this trca presentation from a few years ago they talk about some of the other data types that are really important so just wanted to leave that as a bit of a reference for people but with that understanding of 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 the system based on the field data that we had. Um, we built a Mike Shee model as I talked about for the whole study area. And this is just maybe showing some of the stuff Chris showed for, for Markham as well, but it's showing um, both the existing and post-development recharge distribution, those top two images on the right, and the depth to water table, which were kind of metrics for evaluating impacts. So we obviously don't want to be flooding things out that could have ecological impacts. It could flood people's basements. Um, and from a recharge point of view, again, this area doesn't have any headwater streams, but it's a really important recharge area in serving the streams that are around it. So we constructed this existing conditions model, had an understanding, sorry, the top left corner shows Hall's Pond right in the middle is that blue area at ground surface and shows that it has a recharge function. So 
we had a model that represented our existing conditions. So then we wanted to look at that problem with seeing under layering on land use, how things go above 25 centimeters, the pond level increases by 25 centimeters. So we wanted to understand what was influencing that. So we, um, we did some additional, I'll call them sensitivity runs, where we looked at how the model inputs influence that water level increase between existing and post development. And then we also looked at how modifying our stormwater management approach might influence that. So if we moved, we had both source controls here, I should have said it earlier. So a lot of infiltration LIDs. And we also had some, uh, just a few end of pipe um, facilities, we call them stormwater capture areas that will uh, capture and infiltrate anything that wasn't uh, infiltrated by the, uh, the source control LIDs. So some of the parameters that we looked at here was the bathymetry of the pond, obviously had an influence on both how much water discharges or leaks from the pond, but also you can imagine a pond that's more of a bathtub, an increase in that by 25 centimeters will look very different than if it has really sloped sides. And in terms of that, that habitat that's created or removed or flooded depends on the bathymetry of the pond. We also looked at climate. Uh, so how does variability in climate or wetter or drier climate data sets, how would that um, influence the, the pond itself? We looked at capture volume. In this case, it's a more permeable area. So we were using a LID capture volume of about 20 millimeters per year instead of the 10 that Chris talked about in, in Markham. Um, we looked at some of the assumptions we made about Imperviousness, what's the hydraulic conductivity of a residential area? <laughs> kind of questions like that post development. We looked at how effective are the wetland buffers and also, as I mentioned, moving around some of the stormwater capture pieces. So we don't have a lot of time to get into the details, but what we learned is bathymetry had a really large influence on that future water level. So we found that when we came up, when we got more detailed information on the bathymetry, again, we didn't have any access to the site, but we were, we were able to modify it with some additional information that was provided by others, as well as mapping of vegetation communities to understand uh, depth and, and variability. Uh, we learned that the wetland buffer, although it is effective, it's only having about a three centimeter contribution on its own to that wetland, or able to influence by about three centimeters. Uh, the impervious area conductivity and uh, the climate scenario were even smaller. So it was pretty insensitive. I would say that that specific outcome, the pond level was fairly insensitive to those pieces within what we tested. So with the understanding of how the individual pieces contributed, we started to look at our, our stormwater management. So we've highlighted Hall's Pond there in the middle and that large pink area is an area that was originally plan to be medium density residential. It's gonna have less infiltration, less evapotranspiration. And through the planning process, we decided it was gonna make a, a better community park. So we, that was one update we made to the model through the different iterations. But we have these stormwater capture areas that are those pink boxes shown in the bottom half. And those are areas, again, when our source control is exceeded, we would get water going into those stormwater capture areas and they would leak. The challenge with that is it does raise the water table beneath them, and that raises the water table in the in the natural areas around the wetland and 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 causes general increase in groundwater elevation and was really contributing to that pond. So uh, pond increase. So what we found was by moving around those stormwater capture locations, uh, we were able to to mitigate some of that rise on the order of about four centimeters. We tested different lid capture volumes. So again. Uh, we were using 20 millimeters per impervious hectare. We tried both five and 35, and the wetland water level itself was really insensitive to that. And that makes sense because we were we were seeing that those are very localized impacts because we we're mostly natural heritage right around the pond, and those those effects were more important in other parts of the study area. Uh, we also uh, looked at moving some of those Swaka locations, as I mentioned. And that land use change associated from going from residential to community park was again a fairly small two centimeters. So by implementing these combined changes in our next iteration on land use, we were able to maintain the water balance. So this is one of the, the metrics, I guess, for evaluating the effectiveness of the management scenario. So we have our pre and post development water balance, which Chris has shown comes from out of Mike Shee. Um, but with respect to the hydro period for Hall's Pond, there are some really good outputs here that helped us understand 
uh, pre and post development. So on the right hand side at the top, the plot is showing um, water level change seasonally. So we're showing the 12 months there. What it shows is we're maintaining kind of the frequency of increase and decrease in water level. We're still getting a four centimeter increase in the water level in the pond. But then when we look, but so the question is, is four centimeters bad? 25 seem bad, is, is four bad? So we looked at this bottom plot, which is um, a frequency that an area is ponded. So on the left-hand side, it's showing that 60, so under existing conditions, 60% of the area is flooded 10 to 20% of the time. So that's that mud flat area uh, further inland in the wetland, if I can say it that way. And then 30% of the area is ponded 90 to 100% of the time. So that's the swamp and deep water areas. What you can't see is there are two, uh, both existing and future conditions, basically plot on top of each other. So this gave us some confidence that we're going to maintain the areas that are wet with the frequency that we see pre-development. So maybe just to wrap up from both the examples Chris provided and, and these ones, um, in terms of data, um, there's a range of data. What was important for Claire Maltby is air photos helped us understand pond depths. It helped us understand land use, ponded area changes. Groundwater and surface water levels were pretty fundamental in having continuous ones. Um, hydraulic conductivity estimates, vegetation community mapping, and, and through the years. What we were missing was really continuous water quality, and I think there's been some good examples of how that can, can really help. We had a few snapshots, but nothing continuous. Um, and as Chris pointed out, really, we were able to show in the initial iterations that there was potentially this increase, but we didn't understand how that would influence the function of the wetland. So what that integrated model did is provide us that opportunity to evaluate whether, not just whether the volumes were the same pre and post development, but whether the, the function was maintained. Maybe just as a clo closing slide from all of the, um, the examples that Chris and I presented. There are some data types that are appropriate for all scale, so watershed and sub-watershed scale. And I think as you start to look at smaller and smaller features, you need better spatial distribution, but continuous data is really important at all scales, and that water quality can be really important too, even if it's, it's um, you know, the real-time data, which are those, those really basic, really helpful properties help us understand the changes and calibrate these models. Um, I think we talked about those and just wanted to acknowledge people that contributed here as well. While, while you folks are there, anybody has any questions for Chris and Darren? You're sort of modeling like a higher water scenario, but it wasn't clear to me that, you know, I know we want to look at long term averages, not these one offs. But last year was really dry and this year was even worse. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, we have to be careful not to become slaves to our models and look forward at some of these more extreme changes. Yeah. So one thing I didn't touch on is we had a multi-year climate data set. So we had a lot of dr uh, drought periods as well as wet periods. So, so in the, the broader project objectives, we were looking at those variations and we could see the pond level fluctuating by that much. In fact, the one slide, uh, see if we can find it here. That's showing, uh, for example, that top one, that's showing a good more than a meter and a half, I guess, of pond uh, variation. And that's an averaged version. So it, at least seasonally, we expect to see that change, and, and there are some photos that reflect that. But yeah, within the simulation, we have some drought periods and we have some wet periods to, to get those extremes as well as the average. So, you know, kind of an average. I think we're going, yeah. I don't know how you capture that in a model unless you run some really drastic changes rather well, than looking at just our historical average. Well, and sorry, we're simulating continuous pond level in that model from uh, 2005 to I think it was 20, 2020 or 2019, I forget our last last year. So we we are representing drought periods in the late 2000s. We're wet, representing wetter periods and then 
So you're getting that range now from a climate change extreme, like future climate scenarios, that could be a scenario that you layer on to the top of that to, yeah, to look at sure. even more extreme. Because even the late 2000s don't compare to what we've seen from 2021, 2022, yeah. not even close. Yep. Yeah. So that continuous that you're running, that the result at the bottom, the bottom right figure that you're showing, is a cumulative for the entire period that you were running the model. That's right. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, did you figure out where the cutoff is, where the impact of the the fluctuation becomes too great? So four centimeters wasn't, but what was uh, your? It. So this was a big challenge, I think, and it was a lot of discussion between the ecologists and the stormwater engineers and, and the modelers about what was uh, significant or what was the, the threshold. And there's different different areas of the pond, like some of the areas of the pond really do look like a bathtub and some of the southern areas are more sloped. Um, it seemed like something eight centimeters or lower was giving us a very similar footprint. So that was kind of gauged as as reasonable in those areas that seemed more sensitive to the change. But I think if you ask the ask the group, we we wouldn't be that emphatic that eight centimeters is the number you should use, right? So. Yeah, that was going to say that. Like, was there any discussion from the developer side saying, "Well, you're seeing up to eight centimeters, so that's how much we should be, or how much freedom we should have?" Yeah. So what the city has done is they've built built in a requirement in the study area that, um, to your point as well, that as the development progresses, they're going to have to update the model with new climate data, or um, obviously the development will look different. We've just kind of said this area is medium residential. We haven't laid out the lots and there'll be some slope changes too. So the goal is they're going to have to demonstrate that these functions are maintained with some of that more site specific information. And yeah, one of our challenges I think in these models is you've seen some really good animations and you've seen some really good um, outputs from, from other presentations, but how do you present this in a, in a hard copy report? showing that like an animation is great to show the hydro period and and wish that that was something we could stick in a report so we we tend to simplify them down to some of these frequency plots to show that but within the report we have some ponded we have maps of how the ponded footprint changed through time um yeah so that's i think that's sort of a continuing challenge is how do we present the information now that we can we don't have to deal with averages we're dealing with that and that was actually a point uh, Professor Dickinson uh, reviewed some of the early work for us and gave us some feedback around that as well. So, yeah. And that's why, you know, in our reports moving forward, we are changing from paper copies to wiki documentation because that's where you can update, you can archive, but you can put your animation stuff, which is very important. And like I said, one thing which I like really about, uh, uh, you know, Mike tools is the, the the visuals which which are created, they speak actually they give much more information than you would otherwise uh, receive in or get cut through the data, right? So yeah. so that is something. So again, moving to digital, encouraging you know other partners to do the same is is really um, helpful in that direction. And in a review piece too, that's really important as well. Like the city's uh, development engineers, right, are trying to work from a manual that specifies yeah. very strict. How do they use this information to judge whether a stormwater plan is makes sense or not? Or uh, even the example from Markham, the idea that we'd have variable capture targets was something new that Markham wanted to build in as well. So in areas that were less permeable naturally, the capture target uh, was less than more permeable areas. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Uh, one question from Alexi Newman in the chat. How did you assign or estimate hydraulic conductivity? Was it taken from database of soil properties or estimated in lab? Uh, from field testing. So uh, I mentioned we had a, a number of monitoring wells and dry point posometers. So where where they were of the right size, we were able to do slug tests. If people are familiar with that, you basically um, put a slug of water or a, a physical slug into the well and the water level response can be, you can interpret hydraulic conductivity from that. We also did some Guelph permeometer tests, but they were fairly at the scale. They're really just some samples to check your your um, some of your assumptions. OK, well, thank you so much. Sorry, one more. OK, yeah, there's there's one more in the Q&A. I think you mentioned that 
buffer width didn't have a significant impact on the pond levels as much as the LID. If LID were not feasible, did you find that vegetating them more or less or even increasing the width resulted in significant mitigations that would result in no negative impact to the ecology of the feature? Yeah, so what, what we did test and what we didn't talk about in a lot of detail is the buffer width was basically maintained at 30 meters. But initially we tried it with sort of a mix of grasses and then we converted it to more uh, more of a mix of tree. I think it was, I can't remember the exact number now, but it might have been 70, 30 or something like that between trees and grass. And it did have an influence. I think it was two or three centimeters. And that was specific to this wetland, like another wetland it may be more important or even less important. Um, but I think if you're able to extend that, the width of that buffer, it could have more of an influence as well. I think it's pretty site specific. Uh, just a curious question. In these types of model guided development projects, is it standard practice to go in after the development and test the key outcomes that were predicted by the model? We're trying to make it that way. <laughs> um, both the Markham study and the Guelph study have a requirement in there in the secondary plan that the model should be updated and there would be a need to demonstrate if you if you kind of well either way you're going to need to demonstrate it with the model that you're meeting those so let's admit some of them are kind of the cumulative impact objectives or or mitigation and some are more site scale but yeah so they those have been written in at least to the the plans themselves and i think like miss as we demonstrate that you know how useful these integrated models are it will be important if we are putting in lid features somewhere and groundwater is is you know becoming an issue then it won't work like so it's an issue for for the municipality it's an issue for the developer right so more we present on this stuff more awareness will create and more it will come into uh, the you know the plans that you know you require you are required to do that to make sure what we want to achieve is being achieved or can be achieved right so yeah any question other quick for, questions uh, for the uh, the markham study the the study area was was pretty localized uh, how important was the boundary condition for the groundwater on the influence of infiltration to groundwater levels? Yeah, so we have the luxury here that we already had a larger scale model where we could actually take boundary conditions from from that from previous work altogether, right? So we uh, we actually built a first Mike Sheen model that represented that that existing model, which was a a, a mod flow. I think it was mod flow to GS flow. Yeah, so it was an in, it was an integrated model as well. Um, so we 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 built that in a way, and then from there we zoomed into the actual study area, and we were able to take the boundary conditions from that other model. So that yeah, that certainly helped. Okay, so we'll move on. I know we are late, and uh, let's have a five minute break and come back. And if there are any more questions uh, for any of the speakers, please go ahead and uh, talk, but in five minutes. So. so we'll restart, say, uh, 1049. Welcome back, everybody. So in the first session, we were focusing more on uh, in-stream stuff, in-stream monitoring and modeling watersheds. But there is a great linkage when you look at the lakes, no matter whether it's uh, Lake Ontario or any other great lake or the small lakes. And the reason I'm bringing in small lakes is because the last presentation is going to be interesting because it, it uh, consolidates whatever you will hear to that project and how we are advancing science in that the last project. So, you know, uh, I did some work uh, for source water protection way back in, I think, around 2011 till 2013. 13 uh, and also with the uh, integrated uh, uh, so Lake Ontario integrated shoreline strategy uh, and uh, you know uh, again source water protection model was taken and I knew that they are advancing so um, the Lake Ontario collaborative hired DHI to do further modeling and uh, set up a kind of a real-time uh, platform so that they can monitor spills and uh, how it's going to proceed is that you know the watershed would uh, simulate uh, spills or other nutrients or, or other parameters of concern to their mouth and this model is going to take it further but i'll let uh, Pat talk about this uh, 
lake ontario collaborative model how it was developed and how it is uh, uh, you know uh, it's helping uh, protect uh, lake based water, drinking water intakes pat thank you all right. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I gave this presentation uh, as well at the International Water Association's uh, Water Congress in, in Copenhagen earlier. So, um, I think most of it's applicable for here as well. Um, all right. How does this work here? Just uh, press the. All right, so uh, uh, credit to my uh, my my colleagues here, cast of characters from DHI and uh, and the clients. So, um, Maman mentioned uh, the Lake Ontario Collaborative Group, um, and that I think that's kind of where things got started. But uh, the sorry, I'm not pointing this at anybody. Um, the uh, uh, the real, I guess the the paying clients these days are uh, City of Toronto, Region of Peel, and uh, Region of Durham. So they're they're kind of spearheading uh, this for the kind of the greater Toronto area. Um, yeah, this is a slide here we probably don't need because of the, the group here. But uh, uh, yeah, it, one of the reasons that uh, it was important is is because uh, Lake Ontario is a maybe not the biggest lake uh, of the Great Lakes, but it is the one that provides the most drinking water uh, for or provides drinking water for the, the largest population uh, for of all the lakes there. About six million people in Ontario. I think it's around 9 million people when you include the uh, the US as well. So it's a big source of drinking water and uh, for the greater Toronto area, they they wanted to make sure that uh, they uh, they're kept aware of uh, and, and have a, a tool to make decisions if if there is a spill. So the the background was uh, I guess you know uh, most people here I'm sure are familiar with the uh, events in 2000 when there was uh, some contamination in uh, in Walkerton, uh, a few people died, uh, but a lot of people were sick. Um, 2006, uh, they introduced the, uh, the Clean Water Act, or required uh, um, local communities to identify threats to drinking water and uh, come up with plans and, uh, and in actions to, to address those threats. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, there was a, a bunch of studies done. Um, Matrix, I'm sure, was uh, back then wasn't Matrix, but uh, you guys were involved in a lot of the groundwater type studies. And there was also uh, studies done for, for Lake Ontario to, to identify intake protection zones. And uh, because of the, I guess, the nature of, of how those, those studies were done, they were, they were necessarily conservative because you're, you're looking at a, a model of Lake Ontario and at any one point in time, they would identify what, what are the potential threats, where are they, and, uh, and how could they enter Lake Ontario. And because you're kind of projecting to the future where these things are and, and uh, what might happen and when they might happen, you don't necessarily know which way the water's going to be going. I mean, and which way the winds are blowing. So, so they they had to look at well, if this spill happened over the course of uh, you know many days, what would happen? And if the wind was going in this direction or the wind would go in that direction, you know, how far would it spread? Depending on a range of, of different factors. And so there were again planning level studies to say if a spill happens, this is the area that might potentially be be contaminated by by that spill. And so they were the, the, the protection zones were, were quite large for like a single spill here. But they again, they didn't know if the currents were going to be going this way or that way. So they just had to you know, look at the worst case scenario that it was going to spread both ways. Uh, so then in, in 2019, the region of Peel, Toronto and, and Durham kind of got together and, and I guess through the, the Lake Ontario Collaborative Group identified that they wanted to to introduce um, maybe a more more accurate way to have some uh, decision support when a spill does happen to say, well, can we get a more more accurate representation of what's going on in the lake right now? And based on those conditions, where where, where might we see some impacts from this spill at one of our uh, water uh, treatment plant intakes? So uh, they commissioned us to to uh, DHI to to develop this Lake Ontario water quality forecasting system, and so what it is, this is a web-based platform. It's hosted uh, on uh, Azure Cloud resources. It uh, it collects real-time uh, forecasted data and uh, water levels, uh, current information like current direction and, and velocity, um, rainfall, uh, flows in, in tributaries, and and it uh, kind of collects all that stuff and makes it available for for running the model. Uh, we have a, a real-time continuous uh, uh, hydrodynamic model. It's a Mike 3 model of, uh, of Lake Ontario. 
that was uh, developed by our, our partner in this project, uh, Golder, I guess now it's uh, called Golder WSP or, or something like that, but um, it's now now WSP. But uh, they they were actively involved in in the development and calibration of the uh, of the three dimensional hydrodynamic model for Lake Ontario, and so then what we did is we took that model and we made it uh, updating in in real time. So we take the the climate forecasts, uh, the primarily the wind, uh, the the uh, barometric pressure, and and eventually ice cover information, and we use that to basically force the current in Lake Ontario. So um, depending on how how strong the winds blowing, the the lake currents will be affected and and that determines which which way the water is going along the uh, shorelines. Uh, so that's continuously updating, and then we developed a, uh, a graphical user interface that allows uh, users, whether they're in Durham, Toronto, or, or Peel, to to have access to the system to to create a a spill scenario. And so they're allowed to to enter the the, the attributes or characteristics of that spill, the location, concentrations, etc., and then the, the system will predict, you know, based on where where it is and how much it is where it might impact a, uh, a potential water treatment plant intake. And then if it does have some sort of impact on, on one of the intakes, then it'll issue some kind of a alert and, and send an email to the plant operators to say, here's what's going on. These are the concentrations that it provides like a PDF report uh, of the important uh, reporting parameters. So from a kind of an architectural perspective, I guess, a system architecture, we have real-time data being fed into the system from, from a variety of sources, from, from TRCA, from Ministry of the Environment, um, from uh, Ministry of Natural Resources. And that's all being fed into this, this Mike Operations uh, Decision Support System platform that, uh, that we're using for, for kind of running the system. Weather forecasts are also collected and, and, uh, and stored in the, in the system. We process that information and uh, kind of feed it into the hopper here with uh, climate forecasts, potentially spill details, and some uh, some data simulation techniques that helped us to um, to correct in real time any any errors that we detect uh, in the model. And this is actually it's a really important process when you're doing any kind of forecasting system, because the models will always have some level of of error. I mean, we do spend a great deal of effort and time trying to calibrate this and get get it as accurate as we can. But when you're running it in real time, if you have any small errors, those errors just start to accumulate, and you can you can introduce a lot of drift in the in the water levels or in the currents. So what the data simulation does is it says, OK, we're going to run this model in hindcast mode, say for the last 12 hours. We're going to compare how the model did versus what we've measured in terms of water levels, in terms of current and eventually in terms of temperature. And then we're going to calculate, well, what is the bias in the model versus what we've measured and apply a correction factor for our forecast period. And it also resets the, the initial conditions. So lake levels will be always reset at the beginning of your forecast period for your forecast period. Anyways, that technical stuff, but anyways, the, that information is uh, is is fed into the model. It, it runs about every every six hours. We get a new update on the uh, on the climate forecasts. So every six hours, we run a new set of, uh, of simulations, and that the results are posted to a, a web server that uh, clients can access. And they can see what's going on hydrodynamically, as well as pull up uh, information on on real time data. So the web application, it looks like uh, we see here. Uh, so if you go log into the system, we have a, uh, a, web, a web interface here where we have essentially three panels, uh, an application panel where you can choose between existing conditions, uh, spill forecasting, or intake source tracking. Uh, and then we have a, a map panel just kind of for, for displaying information on the map, and then an analysis panel here where you can pull up time series or, uh, or tabular reports of information that you're, you're interested in. So the the existing conditions panel, whether that's a good a good name for it or not, um, maybe for hydrodynamic forecasting. But uh, what it shows is it gives you a uh, a list here of all the stations where you have collected information on. And uh, so we have a bunch of different types of information: um, wastewater treatment plant intakes, wastewater uh, treatment outfalls, or sorry, water treatment intakes, wastewater outfalls, tributary stream flow stations, climate stations. Uh, lake water levels, current, and, and there's also uh, wave stations as well. And so what it's showing you here is it shows you the real-time information that you can plot here. Uh, in this case here, we're looking at water levels from a couple of different stations uh, uh, around the lake, and you can plot it in you know, the time series here. You can see the, the forecasted uh, information. So this is lake temperature, and you'll be 
be able to, to plot like a three day forecast. What's you know based on the the climate forecast of wind, temperature and uh, barometric pressure. How's that going to influence the lake? What direction is the water going to go and what temperature might be coming in the next uh, three days? Uh, so that kind of gives us our our kind of real time indication of what's going on in the lake right now. And so that and it's continuously being updated. So at any point in time, if there's a spill, you'll be able to go and activate this uh, spill forecasting uh, application here, create a spill scenario and enter in kind of the critical information for a spill. And so we tried, I mean, there's spills are very complicated and and, uh, and, and chemistry and everything that goes into it. But we tried to make this as kind of as simple as possible because the operators who are using this, they're not modelers and they're not chemists and they're not uh, you know, contaminant hydrologists or anything like that. So they uh, they know a bit about it, but uh, there's a lot of information that they, they wouldn't necessarily have at their fingertips. So just kind of the, the real critical information, like the type of spill and, and the pollutant, if they know it, um, what the threshold concentration is for a selected pollutant, so that they'll know, well, you know, if I have this pollutant spill and we have this much going into the, uh, into the lake at this point in time, when it gets the, to the water treatment plant intake, what's the concentration going to be and should I be concerned about it? Uh, the depth uh, of the spill and the spill location, uh, the volume, whether it's a flow volume or, or a flow or, or a volume. So if it's a, a you know, a, a disinfection uh, discharge from a wastewater treatment plant, um, then it would be like a, a flow rate, you know, over a period of days. And if it's a, uh, a spill from, from a, a vessel or something like that in Lake Ontario, then you might have more information on, on volume rather than the flow rate that's going into it. And then the concentration, if you, if you can you know, have that information at your fingertips. So what it does is that it, it, you enter this information here in this interface. Sorry. Enter the information in the interface here, and there's some, some tools to kind of help you locate your spills and whatnot. And then you would execute the simulation. And so what it does then is it takes all that information, it feeds it into the uh, the model, and it'll run. It takes about 20 minutes or so for that that simulation to run for about a three to four day forecast window. And you may be looking at even even more if you if you know the spill happened five days ago when you want to run it to to see what's going to happen in the next three days, and that would be a, like an eight day scenario. And so it might take a bit longer, but it's about you know be 20 minutes and and uh, and 40 minutes of, of simulation time to run through it, generate your results, and then you would be able to, to pull up that scenario uh, on the map here. And we can animate this, I'm not sure. How do we do that? I think this is an animation here, but, uh, oh, is it running? Oh, it is running, Never mind. So yeah, so you can you can pull up the uh, the results here in in this window, and then it'll show you an animation here of the concentrations that are being produced by that uh, that spill, and then as well it'll highlight the water treatment plant intakes that are going to be impacted at a concentration that's higher than the threshold concentration of the pollutant that you've uh, you've identified, and so then you can select the. Uh, the, uh, the treatment plant intakes that you're interested in and plot the concentrations. In this case here, it's a, it's a disinfection failure at the uh, water treatment plant intake at Ashbridge's Bay. Uh, and so you can see you have elevated E. coli concentrations being estimated or predicted at these uh, water uh, treatment plant intakes. And then here you also get a, uh, a summary here of the, uh, the, the time when you had the maximum concentration, what that maximum concentration was and uh, how long your your uh, concentrations are above the threshold for the simulation period. Uh, if there is a uh, an exceedance uh, of the threshold concentration, then it does generate this this PDF report, and it gets emailed to any of the uh, the treatment plan operators that are on the list of people to contact if there is a uh, an exceedance, and so that. Uh, the PDF report just kind of gives you a, a summary of the attributes of the spill and the location, a map of the maximum concentration uh, through the simulation period, a listing of the intakes that are impacted, and then that time series plot showing you the, uh, the different intakes and, and what the concentrations are for the forecast period. As well, we have the, uh, an intake source tracking application, and, and what this does is, is it is allows us to say, well, if we have a biofouling event at one of the uh, the water treatment plant intakes it allows the operators to say well over the last you know say 24 48 72 hours where were we capturing water from 
So it allows them to say, well, if, if we, we know we had a biofouling event at this point in time, where was that water coming from? Uh, and, and to be able to identify what, what the problem areas were. Was it near shore? Was it offshore? Uh, and, and what possibly was causing that biofouling event? And, and so it's, uh, it's a, the groundwater guys here will probably understand this a little bit better than most because it's a, rever it's a reverse particle tracking simulation. And so what it does is it says, OK, we have the, we have the, uh, the forecast is the, the hydrodynamic simulations that have been running for the last you know, number of days. So we have all that information that's stored in, uh, in, in the system for you know, what the current was you know, six hours ago, what it was the previous six hours, 12, 18, 24, all the way back to nine days, I think is what we're currently storing. So we're, current, we're storing nine days of, of hydrodynamic simulation you know, information about currents and water levels and whatnot. And so we, we introduce some particles uh, at this point in time. So this is the simulation end time. So this is when we detected the biofouling event. And we said we want to release particles for this duration. So for the last uh, 24 hours prior to that, that biofouling event being detected, we're going to release particles. And then it's going to take that information and, and travel it backwards in time to say, OK, well, if I released it here, where was it three days ago? So where did that water come from? Where was it three days ago? And it just basically takes our, our, our hydrodynamic forecast and it reverses all the velocities and, and tracks it back in time. So rather than throwing a stick in the stream and watching it float downstream, you you throw it in the stream and say, well, where, where, where did it come from you know, three days ago from, from upstream location? And so the, uh, the, the type of information we can get from that is like these path lines. And so here we have uh, uh, source tracking for, for RL Clark intake in, in May. And we can see that it largely came from, from the near shore area here. And these are, these are particle path lines that show from the start of the simulation to the end of the simulation. So the end of the simulation is when that biofouling event occurred. And the start is, you know, three days ago. All right, and then we can also have uh, have particles being tracked, and the particles can be animated, and we can see what the uh, the depth of the particles were as well. So in this case here, this is from Toronto Island in February, and you can see it came from from across the shore, and then and RL Clark in in May was more of a, a shoreline capture. So um, always important to discuss limitations here. This is a, I mean it's a it's a really great project to be working on. It's been really interesting. The clients been fantastic and. And uh, I think everybody's really happy all around with how it's gone so far. But um, you know, it is important to emphasize that it's a, it's a decision support system, not a decision making system. So we provide information that helps to support decisions that are being made by by the operators and and by management at the uh, the water treatment implant uh, intakes. And and so just because we're detecting a, a concentration that might exceed a threshold value doesn't mean that they're going to shut the plant down because there's other things that they have to take into consideration, including you know, how accurate was the model on that particular day and how accurate was the spill information that was input there? Was it super conservative um, or not? You know, was, there, was there dilution of the source that wasn't taken into consideration? Were we overly conservative on estimating the concentrations at the spill? So those sort of things have to be taken into consideration before a, a decision is made to, to shut down a plant. Um, yeah, the, the model itself, I'd mentioned it's, you know, a lot of work is put into making it as accurate as possible, but it, it's not 100%. I mean, uh, none of these models that, that we were talking about today, none of them are perfect. Uh, they all have, uh, you know, limitations, and it's uh, important to understand what those, what those limitations are. Um, but it, it is, you know, right now it's the best information that we have, and it's better than a planning level study where you're looking at, you know, flow in both directions. So the uh, the project status phase one of the project is complete. It was it was basically a uh, a proof of concept to say, you know, can, can this thing be done and and how good can it be? And, and everybody's pretty happy with it. Uh, so we're we're embarking on on phase two right now, where we're doing some improvements in the uh, the tributary uh, time of travel uh, estimates, um, accounting for spills and storm sewers, and then also incorporating oil spills. So right now, every spill is simulated as a conservative tracer. And so it just assumes that it's completely dissolved solute and, and whatnot in the water, and it just goes you know, as a, a detective, detective dispersive process. Uh, so we're also going to include waves so, or oil so that we have something that, that, that floats on the surface as well, and it'd be more impacted by, by wind than just current uh, as well. Um, 
so yeah, props to, to all the uh, contributing partners on this. Uh, Ministry of the Environment has been involved, um, Ontario Clean Water Agency, Golder, uh, Environment Canada, and then of course uh, the main clients as well. Questions? I think we'll take questions after your second presentation. All right, that, okay. That will make more sense. Um, so, you know, again, how these are these are linked, uh, you know, the way I said earlier that, you know, coming from the watershed, going to the lake. So lake model is, is there, hopefully down the road, the, the watershed model, which, uh, which we are developing would become a part to track any spill in the watershed that goes to the mouth of uh, whatever river or creek is there and how this model will be able to take it further. But in parallel, um, I know Todd has been working on uh, lake ecological aspect for, for years and tons of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge gained there. And uh, Todd is also working on, um, you know, understand the Cladophora growth. And, uh, and that's why DHI was again retained for uh, understanding um, resurgence of uh, uh, of algae uh, in in the in Lake Ontario. I'm glad. So Todd is here uh, present uh, in person, and Bogdan. Thank you so much, Bogdan. Uh, Bogdan is in in Europe, and he's uh, the Lake model at uh, at MECP. So uh, he couldn't make it uh, to present here. Uh, so I had uh, a pat on the hook for this thing, and he was a bit, oh, you know what, really? <laughs> I said, okay, it's a high level, just to give an understanding. Tough questions will go either to, to Todd or to Bogdan, who is online here <laughs> from, from Europe. So let's hear from what's going from an uh, ecological aspect. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so actually this, this project here, this started before the Lake Ontario Water Quality Forecasting uh, System project started. Um, and... I guess. Funny story is I actually thought it was pronounced Cladophora as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't. I was. I was. I was. It was in a meeting, and I kept on saying Cladophora, and then we left the meeting, and I was talking to somebody, and they said Cladophora. And I said, "What the hell's that?" And I said, "No, that's how you pronounce it." <laughs> um, so that just tells you how much I know about this topic, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, the background is a uh, uh, Cladophora is uh, it's native to to the Great Lakes, uh, grows on hard surfaces, uh, can live in depths up to 10 meters below the surface. It in itself is not toxic, uh, not like the the blue green algae, but it, it can carry E. coli and other bacteria. It um, it detaches from the from the surfaces, washes up on shore, and you know, like you can see here, it's a uh, can be kind of messy, smelly, attracts birds, which creates even more problems with uh, with droppings and whatnot. So it can be a real hazard for or inconvenience, I suppose, for recreational areas. And if you've ever gone swimming, you know, in an area where you have these things floating there, it's 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 kind of gross. You know, they're they're pretty slimy and walking on top of it's no great joy either. So so you know, this back in the 50s to 70s, there was a you know pretty uh, predominant increase in, uh, in Cladophora and, and algae in general in the Great Lakes. Um, it was uh, identified there was a problem, obviously, with wastewater treatment plant loading and pollutant discharges into the Great Lakes. And so there was a concerted effort to, to, to clean that up. And, uh, and I guess through the 70s, 80s, and parts of the 90s, so you could see the, a decreasing trend in, uh, in Cladophora. But then in, uh, in recent decades, it's been increasing in spite of a general uh, acceptance that, that, that phosphorus uh, loadings are are decreasing. And so the uh, question was, why why is that happening? Um, so some other smart people realized that uh, Dracenia or Dracenia mussels were, were uh, invading the Great Lakes in the in the 90s. Um, they also uh, are, are shallow water uh, species that form in, on, on hard uh, surfaces and they can uh, in, in colder water uh, live on, on soft and, and hard bottom surfaces. So, um, what's the problem with mussels? I mean, everybody likes them, right? But uh, how do they? What do they have to do with Cladophora growth in, in Lake Ontario? And that, that's kind of the the, uh, the, the crux of, of the research project that they were uh, assigned by Ministry of the Environment is to, to kind of look at well, what is that that link between the uh, Phosphorus management decisions and 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 Cladophora, and so there's uncertainty on on how how they are interacting. You know how how is the uh, the muscle invasion of affecting Cladophora growth, and, and is it uh, really? 
so there's kind of two lines of uh, of of reasoning here. One is that uh, it's just area specific uh, loading of, of phosphorus is affecting uh, overabundance of chlorophyll at at local scales, and the other is that the uh, the mussels might have something to do with it. So that the mussels they they kind of they're, they're active in areas where where the chlorophyll is is uh, being uh, identified as as being over in a in a state that's overabundant, and so. The interaction and the, the way the, the mussels uh, are, I guess, are, are, are living and thriving and, and, uh, and surviving uh, has some influence on, on how the, the Cladophora is, is growing and, uh, and, and increasing in, in Lake Ontario. So the, uh, the objective of this project was to say, well, how can, we, how can we represent that integrated water quality processes between mussels and, and Cladophora uh, growth? In the lake, and so uh, what we what we proposed was to to be able to to use our, our Mike three model that uh, that we've got for for Lake Ontario and the Ecolab tool that you heard about earlier for for Mike Shi. It's a it's a kind of a, a general process, uh, general ecological process model, whereby if you can describe the process that uh, that's influencing that that the growth in in the water, or the transformations in the water, or even movement in the water. Then you can use Ecolab to try to simulate those those processes, as long as you can describe it in some kind of equation-like format. So some of the things that uh, were taken into consideration is is that um, the the mussels have uh, some sort of a filtration uh, effect, so they they tend to, to to clean the water, they they filter it in in areas where they're thriving, and and usually that's a good thing if they clean water, but that also increases increases the the clarity of the water and the clarity of the water allows more sunlight to get to the bottom and that helps to feed the, the cladophora growth. Um, there's a, a high concentration of, of phosphorus on the bottom of the lake on the lake bed and the mussels when they're growing they tend to to try to, to utilize that and they, they try to and, and through that process they increase the, the availability of phosphorus kind of in that that lower uh, lake bed region. Uh, I mentioned about the increase in, in light being uh, caused by or influenced by the, the muscle presence. And then um, Cladophora growth is, is also influenced by lake currents, uh, waves, and, uh, and the temperature. So in essence, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that looking at ecology, chemistry, and hydrodynamics, so it's a really integrated process. It's a pretty complex process, and one that you can't just look at these things in, in isolation. So we, we developed this uh, four-step uh, model structure. So we have a, this hydrodynamic model, that we developed a Mike 3 hydrodynamic model, the one we, we have for, for Lake Ontario spill forecasting system. Um, so we have feeding into that, we have tributaries uh, providing flow and, uh, and phosphorus loads and nutrient loads uh, into Lake Ontario. We have uh, water levels, meteorological data, wind, cloud cover, air temperature, all acting to, to drive the currents and temperature in, uh, and water levels in Lake Ontario. That information is, is fed into to a wave model. The wave model uh, is running as well. And the wave model provides um, some, some surface friction uh, values that, that are, or sort of bed surface uh, stress, I guess, and, and, uh, and factors that influence the, the, uh, the light and clarity uh, of the water and, and help to, to move the muscles around and kick up uh, sediment from the bottom as well. That information is fed into the, the Ecolab model that has descriptions of the muscle growth as well as the, the, the Cladophora formation. And then the results uh, we get out of that are oxygen, nutrients, plankton, Cladophora, and, uh, and muscle populations. So the, uh, the 3D hydrodynamic uh, model for, for Lake Ontario looks like what we see here. This uh, project is not, I mean, we had to develop this model that it was a big part of the, uh, of, of the process, but it wasn't kind of the, the end goal of the, of the project. So I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about the process of, of building that model, uh, more about what we went, in, went into the, uh, the ecological model for, uh, uh, for the process that we're interested in simulating, which is the, the interaction between mussels and, and Cladophora growth. So we have, uh, Three algae species in the model: diatoms, flagellates, and uh, and cyanobacteria, uh, as well as uh, algae indicators like uh, chlorophyll. Uh, there's zooplankton, uh, phosphorus, NH3, NO3, uh, silica, and oxygen. Yeah. And I'm not the chemist here, so <laughs> Todd and Bogdan, I'm sure, can can uh, can help you out. But uh, if you have really detailed questions about that stuff. 
Uh, but yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, information and parameters that kind of go into uh, feeding the, uh, the model. Uh, what, what's important is that the, the, the simulation and, and, the, and the process is described, not just the muscles, but the whole process of, of, uh, of muscle growth from, from, uh, from basically nothing up to, uh, to, to muscles that are, are full grown and, and mature. Um, and then at the bottom, there's, there's a sediment pool. So we have two layers of, of sediment as well that's being simulated. So the uh, the muscle growth uh, uh, model that we're using has has seven different classes of uh, of muscles depending on the uh, the size and and the weight of the individual uh, muscles. Uh, so they they feed off the zooplankton. They 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 grow with time and and availability of the zooplankton, and they transition from from one one class to to the next class depending on on how big they are as calculated by the model, uh, and then. What we're, we're ending up measuring is is the the density of the number of, of muscles that are in an area and and how big they are and we're able to compare that with with measured values that uh, have been been taken over the years so some of the uh, the results that we're able to to obtain from the simulation so it's, it's comparisons of um, water chemistry I guess uh, uh, so this is a normalized root mean square error from April measurements and then from August to September measurements. So there's different seasons uh, in the lake, uh, and depending on temperature and and, uh, and and muscle growth and maturity. And so what we're uh, measuring here is well, how how good are we at at simulating the the, the chemistry that influences the the muscle growth and and the opera growth? And so we can see here we're you know a value of of zero is perfect. Uh, if it's less than one, it's it's pretty okay. Greater than one is really not that great, and so you know we're kind of doing pretty okay with with a lot of them, and uh, and not so good with with some of them. Um, but you know that's that's to be expected. It's a pretty complex process. Um, other indicators here: we looked at uh, at chlorophyll. So the the simulation that we ran, well, we had um, uh, meteorological information, detailed meteorological information for. Uh, 2013. So that's the kind of the, that's the year that we ran for the uh, the hydrological model, or sorry, for the, the hydrodynamic model. Um, and then we also had you know other measured information from from different years, primarily 2008 uh, and 2018. But there was also a, some measurements done by uh, Schofield in, in 2017 to look at uh, chlorophyll measurements in the lake. So this is our, our simulation from from 2013, and this is the uh, the measurement stations that this uh, this uh, school field study uh, took over Lake Ontario here. And so if we look at this uh, profile here, cross section through the lake at this location, this is what the measurements looked like. And from our 2013 study uh, or, or simulation, this is what the uh, the concentrations of chlorophyll looked like as well in our study. So it's different years, of course, but the, that kind of that pattern of, of chlorophyll in Lake June uh, at a depth of around 10 meters or so is kind of similar here as it was for this 2017 study and of course you know different currents different years and, and things are going to be different but and ideally we'd have the same year simulated but we didn't have all of the the the, the inflow uh, measurements and whatnot available for for this year so we just ran our, our 2013 simulation and then similar here we're looking at uh, comparisons of um, uh, cladophora uh, and So this is measured here on the top and this is modeled here on the bottom. And so we're looking at. Can't read that. Yeah, so different. Uh, yeah. So here we have uh, uh, a 2018. Yeah, so two, two measurements, the um, campaigns that were done for looking at. Um, uh, Measured cladophora in 2008 and uh, and 2018, and uh, we're looking at here the the measured biomass of cladophora in these two different years here. We're comparing it with our 2013 simulation year. So they had different measurement uh, locations for for 2008 than they did in 2018, but the simulations results here from uh, our 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 model are the same here. They're both in in June and August and June and August. As we can see, what we're looking at here is just the the different. Um, 
depths that were being measured and, and how the model was able to kind of have that same sort of, of representation here with more, more concentration of cladophora at shallower depths and, and decreasing with deeper depths. And then similarly with uh, looking at uh, muscle accumulation, looking at um, measured muscle accumulation here in 2008 and 2018 versus what the, uh, the model simulated. And so we don't have quite as much range uh, in the model as we had with the measured data. But, uh, you know, looking at the, the values here around 75, 50, between 50 and 100 and between 50 and 100. So not, uh, not as good as we had with the, uh, the cloud offer estimates, but, but still pretty, pretty decent. So I guess in conclusion, you know, the, you know, we were able to develop a, a detailed ecological model that is able to represent some of the key, key processes that influence cloud offer growth and, and, uh, and muscle growth and the interaction between muscles and cloud offer. Um, we have a model that's, I would say, semi-calibrated, does a pretty good job of representing the processes as, <clears throat> as best we could within the, uh, the limitations that we have with the model. Um, yeah, so it's ready, I guess, for passing along to the ministry for, for their applications and further development. Well, thanks, Pat. And uh, any questions uh, for, for Pat from here? And Jan, could you check if there are any online questions? Okay. Any questions from, from here? I was just going to ask Pat, what what is the ministry going to use it for? Mostly just looking at different scenarios for for loading, or or what what are their what do you think their primary applications are? I'll direct that to Todd. Okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> well, it's it's a bit broad in scope. The first stage now will be to take the model and actually run it through the paces. There's a fair amount of testing and calibration required to actually make it uh, functional because you're really representing an ecosystem that's got many moving parts. This is a great step and it puts us in a position to be able to do that. So that's step one. Now step two is in fact uh, dealing with two ranges of problems that extend both from local considerations to the lake scale. Uh, at the lake scale, uh, the ongoing efforts by nationally on the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement have identified or will in the near future identify, you know, one of the primary nu nutrient or eutrophication issues uh, in the, on the lake as Clodophora and a, a major impediment to um, developing phosphorus loading objectives or management objectives for the lake. And so we're hoping to be able to contribute to this process with others in terms of being able to position, you know, the Ontario perspective in terms of nutrient loadings to the lake. Probably the most practical objective, and it's it's a little ways down the road because of the need for the testing, is one of the issues that's been identified is what do local sources, particularly as it relates to sewage treatment plant discharges and urban areas and, and, and sort of the general uh, human footprint, how does that contribute to the clodophora problem? There's great controversy uh, you know, in the scientific uh, arena as to whether local sources are important or whether it is a sort of a broader lake scale ecological thing. And we're hoping to get some movement forward, you know, uh, in terms of that answer. In other words, do you need a more strident approach with respect to local nutrient management? Or is this something that better fits under the umbrella of binational uh, nutrient management, you know, as it relates to the overall loading, loading to the lake? So that's kind of, it's kind of a key piece to, to sort of move ahead some sort of longstanding and somewhat difficult questions on, on phosphorus management uh, in Lake Ontario. Have you gotten insights already on how optimized your monitoring network is or has it highlighted well, gaps in it at all or yeah well okay so that that's an interesting question the going going back a few years uh, the collection of information on this this in this problem area was identified as woefully inadequate and um so back in around 2016 2017 um, in, in cooperation with the federal government environment again and climate change we actually set up long-term Monitor, a monitoring system on Lake Ontario to collect the type of data that's required 
to actually drive this beast. And we've been doing it annually ever since. So we're in a position now where we have relatively strong data in terms of uh, general condition in the lake, but uh, it's not sufficient to get at you know, the broader co complexities of the spatial variability thing. So we're, we're in good position in terms of the monitoring and the ability to, to sort of evaluate this kind of uh, modeling effort. And it's all really been predicated on getting to this point. Uh, at the same time, recognizing it is a binational problem, the USGS has, has also set up a similar monitoring system for Clodhopper. And it's not just for Clodhopper. It's basically a near shore ecological monitoring systems. And they consist of transects, where they do very detailed uh, biological assessments, water chemistry, and a collection of a, a significant amount of physical data. And that's been going on and is expected to go on you know, into the future to sort of drive, to help drive this process forward. Uh, there are a couple questions in the chat. One is for a matrix, which we might get back to later on and the other for Todd or Pat. From Alexi Newman, have you validated Clodophora module, specifically co-limitations by phosphorus, temperature, and light? US EPA conducted in vitro experiments for this to avoid overfitting. That's a good question, and uh, you know, we have not we have not been able to critically evaluate that question. Uh, we are aware of the fact that, uh, based on empirical information, descriptive information, that co-limitation with light is probably as significant as phosphorus. And our, you know, sort of, again, this is where we get to the model the approach here to get at that. It's not the sort of thing uh, where you can do these experiments in a, in a in an isolated situation because of the the interact because of the critical interaction of the the benthic layer and the muscles so we're kind of hard pressed to do that and we have you know not had the capacity to do the kind of system mesocosm studies that are are needed to actually answer those questions in terms of nitrogen uh, again we've 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 got large at this point large amounts of empirical data and we've really seen no sign of any kind of nitrogen related signal. And going back through the long history of Clodopera work on the Great Lakes by multiple parties over time, including culture work, there's never been any suggestion that nitrogen plays a role in the uh, direct limitation of, of, bio, of growth and accrual of biomass. There was just a question uh, in the Q&A. Um, geographically, uh, sorry, this is from Nadine uh, Benoit. Geographically, is the model fitting some sites better than others? For example, North Shore versus South Shore, where can variability be addressed? Yes, yeah, so I, can, I can answer that one. It, it is, uh, the, the focus was on North Shore. So we have, the, the model has a higher resolution uh, mesh elements uh, along the North Shore than it does along the South Shore. Uh, and so that we have we have seen uh, it produce a better fit where we have a higher resolution. So there there is some data that uh, we don't fit so well along the uh, the U.S. side, and and other data we fit better along the Canadian side. So. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the spills model. So you mentioned that every contaminant is treated like a tracer, conserved a tracer. Yes. And then you also gave an example of E. coli. So assuming there's no growth model built into this, That's correct. so how does that underestimate potentially used in your decision making or in the client's decision making? So right now, the uh, we're not involved in any kind of policy making. We're just involved in delivering a tool that they can use to develop their own policies. And each region, I think, is developing their own set of protocols on how to how to formulate a spill problem, uh, how to get that formulation into the input required for the model, and then how to interpret the, the results of that. Uh, the the reason that we've gone with the the conservative uh, approach is is just because we want it to be at, at least conservative, right? And and also because the complexities involved that you can see with you know even with this the second case here, I mean it's it's a 
it's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's already too complicated for many of the operators and to introduce anything more complicated would be uh, a real challenge. And uh, so, I, I mean, I guess that doesn't answer your question. We, the, 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 the regions are themselves still formulating those, those uh, I guess, modifying their emergency response plans to able to, to accommodate the use of this tool in their response, but also, you know, who does make those decisions and who interprets those results and makes a final decision. I guess that's that's not really something that we're we're privy to right now. We're, we're kind of involved in in the process and we're consulting on on some of their uh, initiatives, I guess, and, and their initial plans, but uh, that's up to them. Okay, uh, one final question for Matrix, I think, uh, Darren and Chris. From Alexi Newman, it seems you used high resolution soil data. Was it DSS, Detailed Soil Survey? If so, DSS has aggregated, aggregated polygons with two to three components lumped within one soil polygon. Was there by any chance any consideration of this aggregation in this or other studies? I would say no. <laughs> um, we did use um, in the Claire Maltby and and in the Markham model. We're largely our, our main data set is the Ontario Geological Survey Quaternary Geology piece, and then we always look at the soil survey, but not not in that amount of detail at the subwatershed scale. In these more local scale models, that that is a consideration. Um, and then we also tend to collect more data for the for the site scale pieces that would give us those textural classes and, and maybe more understanding of the, the A and B horizons too. So, but we, we didn't in this case, so. Righty, thank you so much, Pat, and thanks uh, to you, Todd, also for, for pitching in. Um, so the last presentation, and uh, I'm very excited about this project. Uh, brings multiple, you know, aspects which we have learned since, uh, or we, we uh, presented since morning, uh, and how <clears throat> they will be kind of, you know, coming in uh, one way or the other in, in this project. Um, so this is a, a fairly lake cyanobacteria study, which uh, actually we just started uh, this year, uh, and the uh, you know, the main partners are University of 12, CVC, uh, Town of Halton Hills, uh, Halton Region, and of course, DHI. I was joking with, with Pat. I said, Pat, looks like this is a DHI workshop, not CVC. You don't, don't, I don't want anybody else to <laughs> think that I am a DHI employee. No, I am not, right? It's just, you know, <laughs> by chance that, you know, all the, those study which, uh, <laughs> which were uh, kind of um, feeding into this uh, were, were related and were using DHI tools. Uh, so, so that's what it is. Um, so again, you know, and the funds initially came from, from CVC, Halton Region, Halton Hills. And uh, and we got uh, matching funding from uh, NSERC through University of Guelph. Uh, Ed uh, McBean is uh, the principal investigator on this. And of course, I'm so happy to have uh, Robert Henner uh, and uh, Mark uh, here um, from uh, from uh, the biology side and Kat, who is uh, the uh, who is uh, the PhD candidate with uh, uh, Bob. Uh, so, Fairy Lake, just to give uh, a, a bit of uh, overview, uh, it's uh, situated in Acton. It's a fairly small freshwater lake, and uh, it's about 26 hectare, and has a catchment area which has a variety of land use practices from agriculture to uh, uh, to uh, urban side and even the trailer park. So, so it makes it a little bit more complex. But that's what I was thinking that, you know, if we can understand what is being developed for Lake Ontario and apply on this small scale, maybe this will give us more opportunity to refine our model and then extrapolate it to, to the larger lake because still we'll have opportunity to look into uh, more kind of refined uh, stage uh, in this lake. So, yeah, it's a, it's a popular recreational uh, venue uh, for all kinds of purposes from boating, uh, to uh, fishing, even winter fishing, 
uh, and uh, some of the local events also happen along this. And of course, increasing issues related to uh, cyanobacteria and E. coli, uh, depending upon what type of weather we was there. Uh, so the town and, uh, and the region both are uh, trying to investigate what kind of management practices would help to uh, make this uh, lake resilient. And they did a study, water quality study in 2009, and they are wrapping up with another study uh, done by the consultant uh, this year. And we are kind of will be using more uh, data from both the studies to, to build on um, this study. Uh, and just an example, you know, they have been doing different type of management practices, but still uh, cyanobacteria and E. coli um, are, are the issue. Um, and about cyanobacteria, which of course is not algae, which is reflected as, uh, you know, uh, blue green algae or harmful algal bloom. It's it's unique to itself. Like again, you know, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> I'm a I'm an engineer, so I'm just uh, I'll be speaking very high, whatever high level, uh, whatever uh, I've learned so far. It's it's a floating, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing which which can be at the surface, but it can sink into uh, lower levels depending upon where the nutrient enrichment is. So that's what makes it complex. Uh, it's cyanobacteria is always in the system. It's not that it it just comes. It becomes an issue when it it it, it blooms high, and also when it starts uh, uh, you know releasing toxic uh, elements like microcystin, which are harmful for humans and as well as uh, for uh, animals. Um, so the study objective, the main thing is you know what triggers cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, we want to understand that given whatever you know data we are collecting, which was collected in past, uh, and then link that to okay, what are the sources uh, which release those uh, those parameters of interest, and can we put you know again through modeling exercises, can we come up with some scenarios specific to weather? If it is urban area, which is which is the source, then what kind of urban management practice will be? required if it is a rural area then what type of management practice will be required there and if it is a local geese issue then we need to know what uh, what uh, the issues are uh, so i uh, again knowledge provided in earlier presentations is uh, which uh, i'll be talking about that how they are going to uh, come into this thing so again the uh, modeling for any kind of modeling monitor is uh, is, uh, is is the first thing you do and when you set it up, then again, there are two things, catchment contribution and lake dynamics. And you have heard about that. I won't uh, go deeper into because both are very important. What lake is uh, receiving and what is happening within the lake as uh, uh, which is a changing, di uh, you know, dynamically and uh, resulting in um, uh, cyanobacteria blooms. So m monitoring both traditional and non-traditional. And I will say that what what. What, what do we mean by non-traditional for our for this type of stuff? So, yeah, traditional water chemistry. We are collecting um, samples, um, uh, both wet weather and dry weather samples, just to understand that okay means uh, what is being contributed during uh, during wet weather and uh, and uh, the sources. Then we are having so temperature is very important for all these type of studies. So we have two mooring uh, temperature moorings in the lake. Uh, trying to uh, give us understanding of like means whether there's stratification or how the temperature is changing and and the model will be ultimately calibrated to these. This is a unique thing which uh, which we are bringing to this study is eDNA and that's where uh, Bob and Kat are here. So uh, I was attending a conference where a DFF person was presenting on eDNA and I said hmm, that's that's very interesting. This will help us identify sources again. I'm talking about that. Uh, what chemistry can tell us, okay, these these are the parameters which are uh, which are there, but we seldomly get to know what can, where the contributions are coming from. eDNA perhaps will help us what species are there, what species are around, and where the contribution could be coming. And on top of that, uh, you know, uh, maybe you know you're familiar with Tom Edge. He retired from Environment and Climate Change Canada, and I was listening to one of his presentation. I thought, OK, this is cool. Like means uh, again, microbial source tracking could be another aspect which would be really beneficial to the study. Again, given the scale of the study area, 
I think, you know, if we do something, at least it would, it would advance science in the right direction and we can, you know, piggyback back on that. And I'm happy that, you know, I was pointed to Mark and uh, Mark is, uh, is uh, doing uh, microbial source tracking uh, for the study. Of course, we have cameras uh, to to have an understanding of like means uh, what kind of uh, wildlife activity is going on uh, in this area. And uh, we were happy that, you know, <laughs> raccoon was caught at night, you know, being active and uh, and the camera also, you know, this was the first thing which Alex showed me that it captured me too <laughs> when I was <laughs> visiting the lake. So, <laughs> so it's doing its job, you know, I don't know how much I did, I'm contributing, but <laughs> that's the reality. OK, so we have monitoring locations, 11 of them. Uh, each tributary which is feeding into the lake, we are monitoring that for water chemistry. And we also have uh, these lake, lake uh, locations where uh, lake water chemistry is being uh, uh, is collected. And it's not only water chemistry, but this is also being uh, analyzed for eDNA and for MST. Uh, and of course, like I said, that it's always good to have students give them experience like this. So, so that's what uh, uh, this is. Uh, uh, this is there. This is cool thing which I wanted to show that when we kicked off this study, um, uh, we were working with the, with a consultant who was trying to use drone for for lake sampling, and uh, and uh, we had unfortunately we didn't have funding to support this further, but it's it's kind of unique and thank you. So oh, okay, it's good. So this this actually worked very well because there was least disturbance in lake when we were taking the samples. And also, you know, uh, the samples when they were brought on shore, they were filtered right there, and then take, or, taken to the lab, and uh, then cat uh, did, uh, you know, uh, DNA sampling for uh, for this thing. So again, and camera footage, the the credit goes to John Clayton. You know, he's <laughs> we always have him uh, uh, there. So uh, you know, preliminary results we have about, taken about uh, uh, four or five dry samples and wet samples. This is a, just a snapshot of uh, how the total phosphorus concentrations look like. But I was surprised that you know even now the water temperature showed uh, uh, stratification difference in temperature is huge from bottom uh, to the top, which will be helpful in uh, in calibrating the model. And we are setting up uh, uh, the two models here. Mike Shi will be the catchment model for for the catchment area of uh, uh, Fairy Lake, and then Mike Three will be uh, the model for uh, understanding lake dynamics. That's where uh, you know again it's it's coming. Like means whatever experience we have gained so far, our experience which DHI and Matrix has uh, will be used here. And uh, same thing with the with the uh, lake model. And uh, we are hoping that you know the Ecolab. Water quality tool, which was developed for MECP study, will be able to, you know, uh, um, simplify that or adapt it to Fairy Lake uh, for what our needs are. We don't need it for Clodophora, but we definitely need it for cyanobacteria and uh, um, and chlorophyll uh, understanding. So that's what will be used. Uh, and then uh, I'll invite uh, Kathleen Nolan. Uh, she's the PhD candidate with the with the Bob. Uh, to talk about uh, uh, eDNA stuff that, that uh, they are doing. How do I go forward after this? Perfect. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thanks Amajat for the welcome. Um, so as Amajat mentioned, I'm Kathleen Arcat Nolan, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Integrative Biology. Um, and today I'm here to tell you about the environmental DNA work that we've been doing in Fairy Lake. So environmental DNA or eDNA um, is loosely defined as DNA shed by an organism into its surrounding environment. Um, one application of DNA is called DNA metabarcoding, which allows us to get a snapshot of what organisms are using a habitat at a given moment. So eDNA is collected from aquatic environments by filtering the DNA, then extracting the DNA from the filter. Um, then we put the DNA through polymerase chain reaction um, using specific gene markers. So these gene markers are specific sequences that are found in all the organisms in the environment. Um, and for fish communities and vertebrates, we tend to use 12S and CO1 gene markers. So after polymerase chain reaction, 
we then can sequence the DNA from the environment um, using high throughput sequencing, which produces thousands of reads that we then need to sort through and bioinformatically analyze. So we use bioinformatic pipelines to sort, clean, and match the sequences against reference libraries to obtain taxonomic identifications for the species in the sample. This is often used for um, aquatic species like fish, um, and it's becoming more common for other organisms as well. So in Fairy Lake, uh, we did some metabarcoding. We collected uh, eDNA samples from 10 sites around Fairy Lake in August of 2021. And then we used DNA metabarcoding to assess the fish community using the 12S and CO1 markers. 12S uh, targets fish, whereas CO1 uh, is a more general marker that targets vertebrates as well. Um, so for the next few slides, I'll discuss the fish communities that we discovered in Fairy Lake, as well as the vertebrates. So here is a slide that is showing a list of previously confirmed fish species that were detected in Fairy Lake by Credit Valley Conservation prior to our eDNA work. So of this list, all of the expected species were detected with eDNA. Um, and most of them were detected with the 12S gene marker here. All of them except this one, the banded killifish. Luckily, we did pick that one up with the CO1 marker as well. Um, so this is why we use two markers, because sometimes specific markers work better for some taxa, whereas other ones may be uh, more suited for other taxa. Um, overall, CO1 detected fewer species in total, um, but it did provide some broader coverage and pick up ones that we did not get with 12S. So now we'll look at a list of species that were suspected to be using Fairy Lake, but had not been previously confirmed. Um, so as you can see, with the 12S marker, all the expected all the suspected species were detected except for brook trout. So we did not detect brook trout at all with either marker in Fairy Lake, which could mean they're not using it. It could also mean that we just didn't pick up any of their DNA. Um, so yeah, 12S picked up most of these species. CO1 picked up fewer, but still um, provided some coverage. Here's just a graphical summary of what I kind of just went over. So we picked up um, seven of the species that were confirmed using both markers in Fairy Lake, um, one with CO1 and two with 12S only. Um, and in terms of the suspected species, again, most of the species were picked up by both markers, um, with some picked up only by 12S, and then the brook trout species not detected at all. Next, I want to talk about some of the vertebrates that we picked up. Um, we detected a lot of really cool birds, some of which are shown on this slide, um, including things like Canada geese, grackles, wild turkeys. Um, we detected a mute swan, um, ruffed grouse, all kinds of cool birds. Um, and a lot of these birds were confirmed visually during later site visits by me, so um, there's good evidence that they are using this lake. In terms of reptiles and amphibians that we detected, uh, we only really picked up DNA from the painted turtle. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only reptile or amphibian that's using the lake. In fact, we know there are other ones. Um, it just is likely a consequence of PCR bias. So the primers that we were using were not um, tailored to pick up vertebrates and amphibians specifically. So if we're interested in surveying that community in the future, we can use more selective primers for these species. We also detected a lot of really interesting mammals, um, including the common muskrat, the star-nosed mole, American beavers, uh, the meadow vole, raccoons, and eastern gray squirrels. In terms of other things we picked up, um, we just we picked up a lot of potential contaminants uh, of organisms that are associated with humans. Um, for example, uh, organisms that make up human diets like cows, pigs, turkeys, and chickens. Um, and we also picked up horse eDNA um, at some of the sites. So uh, they were detected throughout the lake pretty ubiquitously, um, but the relative strength of the eDNA signal for specific species at different sites could inform um, sources of contamination at those sites, so through human waste or through um, these animals using the lake. Okay, and now I'm going to shift gear a little bit to talk about the uh, focus of the 2022 sampling campaign and also the focus of my PhD research. So microalgae, we've heard a little bit about them. Microalgae and cyanobacteria, oops, <laughs> cyanobacteria. Um, Amanjot said they're not algae. It's kind of a contentious issue. <laughs> Some people lump them together. 
Um, so microalgae and cyanobacteria are all single-celled photosynthetic organisms. They're really cool, they're really beautiful, and they are important in aquatic ecosystems because they form a trophic basis. However, they also call, cause harmful algal blooms, um, which can be a huge threat to human and animal health. So for my PhD thesis, uh, I've collected a total of 126 samples um, from Fairy Lake throughout uh, the summer season in 2022 from five sites. Um, this was done through weekly site visits where I collected environmental DNA samples as well as water samples. So as I had talked about before with meta barcoding, um, in order to do meta barcoding of uh, all the organisms in an environment, it relies on a well-populated reference library um, that you can match the sequences you get against to obtain taxonomic identifications. Unfortunately, um, folks who work in the algae space know that these organisms are pretty understudied um, and there is not a very well-populated reference database available for many taxa. So this means that we need to build these reference libraries by isolating algae from the environment, identifying them and sequencing them with the markers that we're interested in. So um, in my lab, we developed a novel plate-based method for isolating algae, which is kind of demonstrated here. It involves uh, ultra dilution of an environmental sample to one algal cell per well, and then growing out the culture into a uni-algal monoculture, which really just means there's one species of algae in that culture. Once we isolate the strains, we can identify them and DNA barcode them. Um, and again, we're going with a multi-marker approach for algae um, using the 23S, 16S, and 18S uh, ribosomal genes. Okay, so in addition to water samples that I collected for isolating algae, I also collected environmental DNA samples by filtering. Um, and these samples will be used for DNA metabarcoding. So I plan to use the same markers that we use to build the reference library to metabarcode, oops, to metabarcode the uh, eDNA samples. Um, I collected samples at different time points throughout the harmful algal bloom season, which generally happens during the summer. So I collected samples from March to August of 2022. Um, and we can DNA metabarcode those samples um, as I continue to add to this reference library. So this should give us information about what is happening within the microbial community in Fairy Lake during the harmful algal blooms. Um, to gain more insight into the biotic conditions that lead up to and comprise harmful algal blooms. So, so far, um, I've isolated over 100 strains of algae from Fairy Lake using our plate-based method. You can see one of the green algal strains here. Um, we're still working to troubleshoot the algal barcoding. There are lots of considerations that go into that process, including things like adjusting the conditions for PCR, choosing different primers, um, and different extraction methods. So we're planning to move into meta barcoding of the environmental DNA samples I collected over the next year. And um, here are the next steps for kind of my project and how this applies to the Fairy Lake study uh, in particular. So we're going to continue to work at isolating and barcoding the strains over the next few semesters. Um, and building that reference library will be an ongoing effort, um, working to extract the DNA from those filters I collected, meta barcoding the samples with those primers I mentioned before, um, completing the analysis of the data. Um, like I mentioned, meta barcoding analysis is a big bioinformatic task, so that will take a while. <laughs> um, and then writing up the results and publishing and then eventually defending my PhD thesis. And that was all I had prepared today. Thank you all so much. Um, and thanks also for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kat and uh, Bob. This was excellent. And this this gives an opportunity to understand that how this piece will fit in the overall puzzle of uh, uh, of Fairy Lake study, right? So, yeah. So now I'll invite uh, Mark, Mark Habash. He's the Associate Professor with the University of Guelph. And uh, he will talk about the microbial source tracking uh, work he's doing at the Fairy Lake study. All right, great. 
Um, hi, everybody. My name is Mark Habash. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Guelph um, in the School of Environmental Sciences. Um, uh, Manjat, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in the workshop today. Um, it's been great listening to all these different um, aspects of water quality and, and evaluation and modeling that have been going on. Um, for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the microbial source tracking piece that um, my lab has been working on. Um, it's a, an area of research that my research lab um, conducts quite a bit of, um, has been doing quite a bit of work on for a number of years, um, collaborating a lot with the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, I unfortunately didn't get the um, data set for our Ferry Lake um, um, data set completed for the meeting today. It was We couldn't get it um, all finalized for, for the presentation today. So what I thought I would do is um, talk about microbial source tracking generally, just so that we're all on the same page in terms of what it can do and the kind of information it can provide, and then show a couple of examples um, from work that we had done on the Grand River um, using these microbial source tracking tools to look at different sources of fecal pollution impacting that watershed. First off, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the folks that are um, helping with doing the um, actual field work and the research going on in the lab. Um, Avery dunbar Houston, she was the student that was brought on and went and did the field um, work and has been compiling all of the data for, um, for the microbial source tracking work. Um, Dr. Sean Ma and Hanley McDougall have been in the lab helping to train um, Avery and provided a lot of support for her. Um, and we had some funding from NSERC to help with um, um, Avery conducting this work over the summer. So I just wanted to just start off by talking about E. coli a little bit because, I mean, that's the one that we, you know, the fecal indicator that we use when we're looking at water quality. Um, and it's been used, you know, for good reason, I mean, for quite a long time. Um, but, you know, along with all of these, you know, real benefits of its use, there are some, you know, acknowledged limitations of, you know, what we can use with this particular way of evaluating water. Um, and this is sort of where microbial source tracking comes in to help try and address some of these limitations. Um, you know, the first ones up here really are, you know, in terms of, you know, covariating with pathogens in water to look at um, relative risks to human health. You know, there are some questions about certain types of pathogens, um, certainly with the aspects of climate change and, you know, the, the data with increasing water temperatures in Ferry Lake or other regions of Ontario and, and more broadly, um, you know, across Canada, you know, there are concerns that E. coli could become naturalized in the environment and then its utilization as a fecal indicator might be impacted, you know, in the future. Um, certainly, it's a reactive way to look at water quality issues, you know, waiting 24, sometimes even longer to get data sets from um, that culture based method. Um, may not allow us to, um, you know, address water quality issues in real time. Um, and certainly the last one and the one that's really going to be the one that microbial source tracking hits is the ability to detect and understand what are the sources of fecal pollution impacting a uh, water source. Um, e. coli is not able to do that at this point. Uh, so other tools um, have been looked to be developed to help when trying to evaluate a water system that could be impacted by any number of these different types of organisms. So. You know, when we're looking at surface water, um, certainly we've got wildlife, companion animals, um, agricultural animals, and certainly human influences that are all a big mishmash of what's entering into a, a water source. And trying to tease apart which one is there um, is really critical when we're trying to, you know, especially when it's in relation to human health and trying to understand you know, are there potential pathogens there that could impact people? Because certainly some of these organisms will not have any direct influence on that aspect of it, um, while others will have very severe consequences potentially. So knowing and being able to tease that information apart is really important. Um, the other aspect too is understanding particular sources can also help with nutrient loading into water sources as well. Um, so this microbial source tracking tool that we can use is one that can help identify those types of sources. Um, this is just a brief table identifying some of the different types that have been used. Um, bacteriophages, um, human viruses, um, mitochondrial DNA from different organisms have all been you know, looked at as potential tools to, um, to use as, as a microbial source tracking tool. 
Um, the one that I'm going to focus on and the one that my lab has been work working on quite a bit is looking at this group of bacteria called the Bacteroidales. Um, and they have been shown to be quite um, uh, host specific across a broad range of different kinds of hosts. And um, it's been in part why we focused on that particular group um, um, in through the research that we've been doing. So why looking at the Bacteroidales as alternative fecal indicators? Um, the specific genus that we look at is Bacteroides. Um, it's an intestinal inhabitant similar to E. coli. It's a commensal organism. A couple of interesting points. It's found in 100 to 1,000 times greater concentration than E. coli, so it might help in making it more easily detected in the environment um, for longer periods of time. Um, it is an anaerobic microorganism, so its um, potential for growth in the environment is limited. Um, unlike E. coli, which can grow um, in um, environments with um, oxygen present. Um, some strains have been shown to be host specific. Um, and again, because of this anaerobic nature um, of this organism, we use culture independent methods for its um, um, detection. And, and that's been PCR, um, as Kat mentioned in her presentation. Using that particular technology as a way of identifying and um, detecting specific genetic sequences in a, um, a, an environmental sample um, has been a really useful tool in developing this kind of technology. Um, so generally, how is it done? So for the bacteroidales, and this can be applied to any of the other kinds of markers that were indicated, you know, we've got a number of different kinds of hosts, you know, bovine, gull, Canada goose, porcine, canine, and human. Each one will have a bacterial community associated with that host. And within that community, we can identify genetic markers that are specific for that host, that are attributed to those bacteria that are present in their gut. Um, and so we can develop an assay to identify those markers and detect them so that ultimately when we go out and collect a polluted water sample, we can filter it, collect the DNA from that sample, use PCR to detect those different markers, and then ultimately come back with an identification of what was there in the first place. Um, and, and by developing different ones, it can help us in um, sorting out the different hosts. And we can also find ones that are also non-specific um, so that it can be more broad in terms of um, understanding, um, you know, general senses of, of pollution that are occurring in a particular water um, body. Um, and that's also important because with PCR, one of its challenges is we're picking specific targets. And, you know, we may only pick two or three that are of particular importance, and there's a lot that we might be missing. So by having these general markers that cover more types of hosts, it allows us to get a better idea of sort of the broad impact that's happening in a water body. The one that we've been working on um, in collaboration with um, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks um, has been looking at three specific markers. One, this general one, that, general one that I just mentioned, and two host specific ones, one for human and one for bovine, um, based on these bacteroidales bacteria. Um, it's a PCR assay that we work with. And the general process, you know, it matches a, um, a lot with what we do with E. coli um, sampling in, in water as well. We deal with a 100 mil water sample. It's filtered, um, but then instead of being um, placed on a microbiological medium to look for E. coli, we can then take that filter, extract the DNA from it, and then use PCR to identify the different markers that are of interest. So, the Grand River study site that we've been working at was really useful in trying to field test some of these assays um, and ensure that they are picking up, you know, the types of markers that we're interested in, both in situations in point source and non-point source um, sites. So along the Grand River here, um, we had five sites. This most northerly site was one that was like the least impacted by human and bovine sources. We had two um, sites here that were um, known to be impacted by um, by cows and cow manure. And then below here, we had two urban sites, you know, obviously a wastewater treatment plant and a drinking water intake down here that were known to be impacted by human um, signals. Um, and certainly the wastewater treatment plant acting as a point source um, in that river. So we had these different sites that we could use to test 
these these markers and these tools, make sure they were picking up the things they were supposed to and not picking up things they weren't supposed to. Um, comparing our general marker and the cultural bull E. coli measurements were really interesting because both of these types of markers should actually be very similar to one another. E. coli is a very general marker, it's not host specific, and certainly the total or general bacteroid ailes marker is similar in that way. And so on the x axis here, we had the different sites, and the y axis, the abundance of the different markers that we were measuring. And again, looking at the trends between the two with these box plots, um, it was very similar in nature. Um, you know, the wastewater treatment plant for both had the highest level of detection. Um, and the other sites had sort of relatively speaking were were similar in terms of um, where they were uh, where they were uh, detected. The other interesting thing, too, was the abundance of E. coli was about a thousand times less um, than what we had for the bacteroid ailes marker, which sort of matched what our expected difference were in terms of abundance in the gut. When it came to host specific markers, um, this is really where sort of those those really shone and, and gave us a really good indication of where human signal was to be located and where bovine signal was to be located. Um, on the top graph here, um, we presented the data as a percentage of the total bacteroides mark uh, signal that was detected. So right here we're seeing, for example, in this box plot, the median here was around 25 or 27 percent of the signal represented by um, human signal um, at the wastewater treatment plant. Whereas here, the median for um, our other urban site was around 10 percent. And of course, there's a wide range of values that were occurring there. Um, and our other sites had very low relative detections of human signal, which were expected. Conversely, when we looked at the bovine signal, both the urban sites, you know, had very low um, abundance, while our sites, you know, known to have impacts by um, uh, cows, showed increases in the abundance or the relative percentage of that marker shown at those sites. So these kind of data just re re um, um, supported the notion that these markers could detect the specific organism that it was intended to. Um, we could track it um, in different sites and um, uh, you know, we could also link it to E. coli, especially with the general marker to look at general trends um, across these sites. Um, these box plots were, you know, aggregates of data that were compiled over an entire um, year. Um, certainly, we can present the data as um, a timeline showing spatial differences and trends in terms of abundance of these markers at different sites. Um, we can also correlate them with um, other markers, such as, um, as Kat mentioned, they were doing the eDNA markers for um, cows and other organisms. So these types of, of data here can be linked up with those as well um, to confirm what we're detecting. Um, we can also add that in with uh, land use information, um, hydrological data. All of these types of pieces of information can help in you know, better understanding does it make sense that we're detecting these types of markers at these sites? Uh, so it's meant to be, you know, as part of a broader set of, of um, parameters that we measure at all of these sites to help confirm and, and add more information about what's specifically impacting um, these sites. All right, um, and just to finalize and why this would really work well with the Ferry Lake site, Again, we've got agricultural sources around here, certainly a lot of um, residential areas around here. There's the beach as well. So these types of multi-use sites really are amenable to the use of microbial source tracking um, to be able to identify locations and sources of where you know, fecal impacts could be occurring around the, um, around the lake. And we'll have data for all of these sites um, that we'll be compiling and finishing up um, the analysis and be able to present that um, at a future time to everybody here. I'm wondering if there are any questions. There's one question in the chat from Don Ford. Any research on bacteroides in Ontario groundwater? Um, we have tested it in groundwater. 
um, it's it's not used as commonly in groundwater, um, largely um, because of the thoughts that we can get the bacteria not transporting through that system very well. Um, people have used viruses in those cases to better track, um, to do source tracking in, in groundwater. Um, it's mainly surface waters where, where this, the, the bacteroides are used um, for, for doing that type of work. The technology looks very promising. What is the main, uh, I guess, roadblock to large scale uptake? Or I think there's there's two th there's a couple of things I would say. Um, first off, it's um, and it depends what the goal is for its use. If it's meant to be in a similar vein to E. coli in terms of identifying um, times when a water body is contaminated and potentially harmful to human health, Bacteroides um, using these microbial source tracking tools isn't at that point yet. We don't have an actionable threshold that we can say above this people shouldn't swim or you can't use this water. We don't have that yet. That's actually a, a piece of research that um, I'm very interested in pursuing and understanding. There are there is work in the US where they've started to do that, but it's still at its in its infancy. Um, um, certainly looking at trends over time um, impacts by precipitation and, and um, um, the introduction of these markers into a water body, um, it can be really useful in, in um, looking at those types of, of uh, um, situations. And again, to help um, guide where resources can be placed to help remediate a site. Um, one great example of this is Bluffers Park in Toronto. Um, it used to be um, constantly closed and posted. Um, and um, they did a microbial source tracking study on that site, found there was a lot of goose poop that was causing a lot of the issues. Um, there was some impacts from the um, wastewater treatment plant. But once they knew where those sources were, they could direct those resources to manage those, um, where those, those um, sources of pollution are coming from. And soon after that, it was within, I think, five or seven years of starting that study and then beginning to implement those um, uh, remediation effects, um, the beach had became a blue, blue flag accredited beach. So there are examples where it can be used to help in, in remediating a site. So, so it, I would say, you know, those are some of the ways in which we can use it right now um, in terms of you know, actionable um, items for identifying risks to human health, not quite yet. But that I think down the road, it, it will, um, it'll come about. And the other neat thing with this type of work is it can be done, um, the data set can be almost real time. Um, there are ways, and we're looking at this, you know, in the field, doing the um, water filtration extraction and PCR in the field. So within a couple of hours of collecting your sample, getting a data point and saying, OK, not OK, right? So these are all things coming down the pike where now we can, um, in terms of managing our water sources and managing the people using them, we can have it in closer proximity to when people want to use it. So, so these are things down the road for sure. But are exciting parts to it all, I would say. So <laughs> are there any other questions? Yeah. So would, are you considering then using it for source loadings? You mentioned something about loadings, like quantifying loads, whether from nutrients or is that down the road or? That, yeah, I mean, I think it, this is something where I think this um, this project on Ferry Lake will be very useful in looking at that because um, they are measuring these chemical parameters of the water and we're collecting the samples for MST at the same time. So we've got this temporal aspect where everything's being done simultaneously we can look at that too um, and see if there are any correlations between them or not. So absolutely something that would be of interest, you know, that's of interest to look at as part of this. Yeah, and then expand its use, right? Because it's more than just looking at whether it's um, human health impacts, but are there, you know, environmental impacts in relation to algal blooms or other types of um, loadings that nutrient loadings that may happen in, in water bodies as well. This is a follow-up from Don Ford. Given that 
the groundwater system is mostly anaerobic. If Bacteroides is anaerobic, it might be good to look for as opposed to E. coli. Um, yeah, I mean, whether they'd be able to sustain themselves in that environment, it's, it's hard to know. Um, I don't know of any studies that have been done looking at that, but would certainly be of interest to see, you know, within sort of that nutrient limited um, groundwater environment, temperature really cold, <laughs> they may not grow very well. Um, they might be like they may remain um, intact, but not be you know actively growing in that environment. But certainly something to 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 consider uh, and 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 to look at. I mean, sediment in surface waters, I think, would be an awesome place to try and see if they would actually remain there. Um, and then you're getting potential uh, resuspension during rain events and such. You know, they are anaerobic. At, uh, as well, so that might be a spot where it might be important to look at. Yeah. Is your lab working on other um, uh, source dependent, uh, you know, tracers for, because obviously the, the bird is one real hole in the, yep. in, in the mesh right now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. I mean, I think this is in part where the sequencing um, technologies can really be helpful. Um, as you saw, like, I mean, the to the general marker, when you get it as a proportion, you look at proportions with host specific ones, it's not 100%. There's lots of other stuff in there and stuff that we have no idea what it is. So using sequencing based technologies can help us identify birds or other things that might be there that are are a problem. Um, there are specific markers for things like uh, gulls, um, Canada goose, that have been developed by other researchers, um, for sure. Um, Tom Edge um, is, you know, has been working in this area for a very long time, and he's developed a lot of these markers as well. So, um, but again, it's it's how many are it, it becomes a resource thing at, at times, right? How many of these markers are you willing to to add? you know, and, and work on is, is it going to be three or 10 or because there are so many things. So that's why I think the sequencing part um, can help in um, informing us of what are the things that are there. And then the PCR tests can then be, um, we can pick out which ones are important in those particular sites to um, provide us with a more like a, a quicker turnaround in terms of getting data, um, being able to do it in a more routine fashion if we need to. Um, and we see that with the wastewater based um, uh, surveillance we're doing with SARS-CoV-2 these days. Um, you know, we can use PCR to do the quick detection, you know, whether the virus is there or not, but you need something like sequencing to look at all the different variants. Um, it's not feasible to run all the different kinds of PCRs to look at that. So I think there's absolutely um, a, a huge space where both of these technologies can work together to inform one, other, one another and help guide how you're going to um, monitor a site. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, so I'm on the last slide. <laughs> what were you more? This is just uh, to tell you that the final product which uh, we are expecting from this uh, entire cyanobacteria study is uh, we'll be developing a, a disease support system where you know all the monitoring and modeling things would come together, and uh, once you once it the data is given to it that what type of source. Uh, is, it has been identified uh, and then it would spit out that what type of best management practices are available and uh, uh, help managers of uh, that lake to again move forward and see that what options are there and where to implement them so that you know the, the source is protected. So that's that's the final goal of uh, this whole study. Uh, you know it's a little bit over ambitious, but that's how I work. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, um, 
any other question uh, on this project for me or any other presenters? Good, we are all hungry. <laughs> so just to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Um, Again, you know, this is some kind of timeline for this project. The end report will be available, uh, will be produced by end of 2024. Uh, that's what we are expecting. And uh, and to wrap it up, you know, uh, again, you know, the same thing. We will try to share this, and we'll we'll really be happy if uh, any other thought comes to your mind. Share it with us. We'll we'll appreciate that. Let's keep advancing science the way we are. Lots of interesting things happening, monitoring, modeling, and other stuff. Let's keep uh, each other engaged on that and see where we can go and pass it, passing the torch to younger folks. <laughs> That's it. And thank you so much for uh, for coming here, attending in person, and also to those who are attending remotely. Really appreciate uh, your your presence here. And please feel free if you have any other question, follow up questions. Send it to us, and uh, if it's not uh, under our realm, then I'll make sure that you get uh, uh, an answer for whatever question you may have. Thank you again. <laughs>